I'm only 17 and here I am on the bridge of the Camry. I had to divide my very slim resources twice as much as before. The capture of Mount Kent cleared the way for more Marines and Paras to move up for the final assault. I have just heard that the white flag is flying over Stanley. Stanley. <laughs> The white ensign flies alongside the Union Jack in South Georgia. God save the Queen. And congratulate our forces and the Marines. Molly, how are you, brother? I'm good. Thanks very much, Chris. How are you? Yes, I'm absolutely super, mate. And uh, yeah, enjoying a, a bit, something of a heat wave here in the Southwest. Yeah, same here on the Isle of Wight. It's been absolutely red as the last couple of days. Yes. I'm not going to complain, eh? No, definitely not. <laughs> could be dark more in winter. It could be, with a large all, pack on all, your back, digging a hole. Yeah, but all the Falklands, so. Mm. And uh, we got to thank Andy, haven't we? So big, massive yeah. shout out to Andy. Andy for putting us in touch. Andy contacted me, folks, and said, you've got to speak to Molly. He's, see- he's seen a bit. He's done a bit. And... um especially in this commemorative 40th anniversary of the Falklands. Thank you ever so much for coming on, mate. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and thanks, Andy, uh, yes. for pointing me in this direction and hooking us up together. So judging by your appearance, I'm guessing you went through training in around the 90s? Oh, you, you do me some credit there, Chris. A little bit earlier than that, 1980, I joined up September. September 1980, at the ripe old age of 17. I'd literally just turned 17 in the August and joined up in the September. My gosh, and how little did you know what, what, what was coming in two years' time? Uh, I don't think anybody really did. Um, I think uh, something that's interesting, we were chatting at one of the Falklands reunions recently, was about um, how many silverware a lot of people have on their chest nowadays and uh, when you do that photograph that you have in training you know in the lovets that they send home to your parents to make you proud you normally borrow the training team's lovets for that or well, you did in those days because yours weren't ready and uh, they I can't remember whose it was but they had two medals an NI medal and something else I can't remember what it was UN one I think and uh, we were all enthralled by this and you know oh, well, we get a couple of medals you know at that age and uh, I remember one of them said well the average way that it works out, sort of every 10 years, the cause involved in some kind of conflict of trouble. So in a 22-year career, yeah, you'll, you'll get two, maybe three, with a good conduct medal or something like that. Um, little did we know what was going to come over the hill very quickly. And then with the, the crash of the wall uh, and the instability that brought all the other operations that the Corps has been involved in, or well, the British military in general, but the Corps particularly has been involved in over the years. So... We exceeded that number of two or three, quite a few people of that era by by some margin. Yes, and and good credit to you. What was uh, what was training like back then? Is it as easy as they say it was? Um, strangely, it's hard. It was the old thing where a lot of people left very quickly in the first couple of weeks, not quite what they expected. But of course, that was the days before you had PRMC and all that good stuff. So. You didn't do any of that. So it was a two-way street to see what it'd be like. So I think a lot of people got there and decided this is really not for me and what I was not expecting. So they leave quite early. 
Um, I think it pretty much follows the same process, more or less, as it does now. Um, I think it's a well-proven thing. I think um, it's not changed very much. It's tweaked here and there, new weapon systems, new comm systems. But pretty much, I think it, 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 it produces the goods, and I don't think anybody wants to tweak with it. Um, is it different? Um, I did a study. Uh, I did an MSC. Having left school with one GCSE, that was something I was quite proud of. I did a, a course sent me to Brunel University for you, and I did a study on occupational stress and well-being of all things um, in, in recruit training. Uh, and some parts of that were published, actually, that report. Um, but I kind of got quite a good insight from a research point of view about how people cope with stress. And one of the things I was doing with INM was expecting when we did these questionnaires and studies throughout the training that the recruits would actually report that they were under a lot of stress, but that they were coping quite well because of strong resilience. But actually what the data produced, and let's go back and check this, was that they weren't stressed uh, and that actually they were coping very well with training. Maybe not on the physical aspect, but from the mental aspects. Uh, uh, and that was quite an eye opener, I have to say. But I think a lot of that goes down to the type of characters that are drawn to the core, the challenge. They expect to be treated like that. They want it to be hard. Nobody joins up wanting it to be easy. They want it to be tough. They want to prove themselves. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's probably still the same. And, and I found it tough. Got back trooped. Don't mind admitting that on here. Uh, you know, at the time, that was a kick in the teeth because it was just before the commando phase, but I got glandular fever. And uh mate of mine, uh, Ricky, um, we were just going to pick up our warrant for your long one long weekend you got in those days in the 32 weeks. And I uh, said, so I just need to lay down. I just feel a bit tired. And then woke up three days later uh, in uh, R&H down in Plymouth, the old hospital with tubes up my nose saying I was going to be back troop. So that was a bit of a kick in the teeth because it was close to finishing with my original troop. Um, but uh, yeah, um, but I guess the lessons I learned from that was Pretty much, I've always been independent and followed my own drumbeat. Always spoke in my mind. I do that in my civilian world and work now, and I always did it in the corps. Um, so they put me in hunter troop and told me I wouldn't be able to rejoin training for six months, uh, and I wasn't having any of that. <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm not doing this for six months. <laughs> um, so uh, after probably about six weeks, when I felt quite strong again. Um, I went to the OC and asked to, asked to have an orderly room and said to him, you know, I feel like I'm good enough to go back in the troops. Well, the doctor's saying that you're not allowed to, got to take six months off, can't do fears. And I said, well, I said, if that's the case, I said, oh, I'm just going to leave then and just put my chit in. I'll go and join the Paris. Not that I really wanted to join the Paris, um, but I didn't want to spend six months in Hunter Troop either. So uh, it kind of took that on board and said, okay how serious are you? And I said, I'm deadly serious. I'm not doing six months in hunter troop. I've come here to do something and I want to get something done. And if I can't do this, I'll do something else. Um, so they said, they came back a couple of days later and said, okay, the deal is if you can do two four mile speed marches and two six mile speed marches with kit on back to back and pass them, then we'll put you back in the troop. Um, so that's what I did. Um, and then went into um, one five four troop, uh, which was only three troops behind my original one. Um, and um, yeah, past training. I, I think the only thing which ever irked me a bit, it was very obvious. Um, well, there was there was three things out of that troop back trooping. The first one was um, the personalities in there. So uh, a guy called Josh Shields, who's the troop sergeant, who's the famous picture in the Falklands on the point five brown in four two commando. The provy sergeant, he was my troop sergeant. So uh, that that was. Uh, Interesting. And I saw Joss recently, the reunion, he's looking well. Had to pick him up for his tie a little bit, looking a bit shabby on parade, but it was all good. Uh, and then um, the other one was Mick Eccles, uh, who got the um, MM down south. So Mick uh, was my section corporal in training, um, but he was also my section corporal in the Falklands and K Company, which is a small world. So those things are when they say, fire and manoeuvre, make sure you do it properly. Uh, actually, proved to be very true in this case in a very short period of time afterwards. Um, so that, that was interesting. I think the only thing is that they probably didn't look at the records of why you were back troop. So though I passed all the commando tests first time, I was no way a rising star. I was run down and I was struggling through it. And 
you know, managed to get through them all. Uh, first time attempts and passed, but I was hanging out. Um, uh, and I kind of think the training team thought I was the malinger at the back rather than this bloke shouldn't be doing this now, but he's passing the first time. But I don't think they were probably aware of my situation. So that always, I wouldn't say irked me, but it would have been nice if they maybe been a bit more appreciative that the effort that I was putting in. But hey, don't really matter at the end of the day. Got my, uh, got my green berry, passed out training, uh, and then went and joined 4-2 Commander. Not enough is made, Molly, of, of lads that have to go into the hunter tree. Well, I don't even know if it's called that now, but um, I mean, I, they, they phone me up when they're struggling. Well, f- four or five of the lads have now, and I just talk them through the, the mindset that they need to develop to get back in the tree and start smashing it again. All yeah. the lads I've chatted to have gone on to get their their green lids, but it's brought it home to me that I never had to deal with that stuff, right? Like, to me, I looked at that notice board, what it said we're doing today, that's what I did today. I think maybe they did it a week in advance, so you saw the next week. I thought, right, we've got that tomorrow. That is literally as far forward as I thought. And because I passed everything, uh, all except the swimming test, which took me to, I think, week 30 or something, I never had this, the stress um, of being back trooped. And that is stress. I mean, that it, it's a whole, it's a whole, it's something lads can feel proud about is having to get over that hurdle, get back into a troop, get the mind in gear again, and and then going forward to get a, a green lid. It's, it's, uh, I think it's, yeah. just, I think it's overlooked. I think it is overlooked. And we always say, you know, sometimes the biggest strength is when you learn from setbacks and failures in life. And a lot of people that end up in, those troops, you know, like myself, was through an illness. I didn't go out to get glandular fever, and it's quite a serious illness, you know, particularly when you're doing a lot of hard fizzing around it. A lot of people end up, you know, stress fractures, breaking things. Um, so, you know, actually, I probably had a sense that when I left training, I was probably a little bit embarrassed about being a back trooper, if I'm honest. I'm not now, clearly too old to worry about anything, be embarrassed about, you know, anything in life, really. Um, but, Certainly for the first few years, certainly I felt a bit embarrassed about it. I, I, you know, even though I'd overcome things and did more to get back into training and then passed it, um, I think there is that sense that you're seen. Whether it's true or not is a different thing, but I think there is a sense there that you feel that you, you've, you've failed at something and then you've got to be stronger to get back into it. Um, and I think, they have, I think they have a lot of mentors now and people of, I was going to say my age, you're a bit younger than me, Chris, but our age, I think, who are involved in helping to mentor people. And I think you just said you do some of that as well, which I think is really a positive thing. Certainly didn't have it in my day. It was just get in there and, and swim or sink. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you arrived at, what, 4-2 Commando? Yeah, 4-2 Commando. Um, and uh, thought I'd join the French Foreign Legion uh, at first. Arrived at Bickley, you know, in a rainy dark night and uh, wondered what was going on. And when I asked where the guard room was, what I needed to do, um, there was, I can't remember if there were poles or if there were checkers or vacuums, but there were definitely bootnecks with foreign. That's when bootnecks did the game uh, with very strong accents. And there's, the, you know, in those days, I think there's quite a lot. There's a lot of South Africans now, but there was a lot more people from around Europe and things in the court. It was a lot more common, um, but it, it was a bit of a, you know, dim light at the front gate of Bickley with two guys with foreign accents. I thought I was joining the foreign legion for a minute, you know, guard rooms over there. I was like, right, okay, roger that. Yeah, so joined that. Um, joined K Company. Uh, love 4-2. I, I guess that's my um, parent unit. Served in all the commander units. So I served in um, 4-2 twice. Uh, once as a uh, four years in K Company, then as an officer. Uh, and then served in 4-5 Commando and 40 Commando a couple of times as well. But I'd say 4 twos, my first experience and my my home unit. I think once you've served in all of them, they're very similar. They've all got their unique um, culture slightly, I guess. It's slightly different. It's all bootnecks together. Um, but uh, they are slightly different for sure. Um, but 4-2, yeah, definitely that's that's my, that my core home. 
for want of a better word, both in the Royal Marines and my core inside me. You know, when I go back to Bickley, I, I absolutely love it. It brings back lots of memories. Um, so, yeah, joined K Company. And uh, that was, uh, four two were uh, a great organisation then, which they still are, having just done the reunion. Um, the infrastructure's changed a bit. Um, the uh, joined that and then prepared to go off to Norway. That was my first. In fact, my first deployment wasn't it, it was Copenhagen. Um, the only thing I remember about Copenhagen is I learned how bootnecks are very good at acquiring things such as free bikes to get back from the run ashore and then leave them by the ship in big piles for people to collect, <laughs> which could drive the probably mad. <laughs> uh, and the other one that put in a harbour position in a cabbage field in the pissing rain that goes on for about 18 hours and trying to put a bivvy up against a load of cabbages that are about two foot high is not an act of war and something that was a particularly pleasant experience. That's all I can remember from that. How high should a bivvy be? Um, well, I don't know how high it should be, but I know that two foot wasn't enough in a muddy field yeah. and, and cabbages are not strong enough to hold a bivvy up. I was going to say as high as cover allows. So <laughs> two foot in this case. <laughs> yeah. And they're big cabbages. Uh, they were big cabbages. Yeah. I think we got out of the rain there. Mick Eccles had joined the company and took a smoke grenade and found a cave, but I think it was full of um, critters and stuff. So he smoked them out with a smoke grenade. And I, I think most of the troop managed to cram into this. But it seemed like it wasn't a very big cave, but we all managed to get in there out of the weather for a while um, and protect ourselves. Uh, and then, yeah, then went off to Norway, but I didn't do my first, my very first Norway, and I ended up doing a lot of Norways. I didn't do my first one with um, K Company, and I was a bit disappointed initially because that was the days when you used to be selected to go and train the 29 commando. Mm -hmm. So there were select Marines around from the different commando units to go and train on the guns, on the gun subs. Um, so I did my first winter with 29 commando, and actually, in retrospect, it was a hard, hard winter. Digging those guns in and moving about and operating in the cold and under helicopters constantly is a is a hard, hard thing. Um, but more importantly, it did come to fruition that in the Falklands, they did get hit and they lost a gun sub and it was Marines that actually manned those guns when it came shove to push. They don't do that sort of scope anymore. I think it's a bit more technical with the guns they have now and the kit, but in those days, that's what they did. So, um, yeah, but, you know, I found that really interesting. Then did that and then, came back to K Company and went on on leave with a pocket full of cash that I'd never had before as a young man, doing what every other young bootneck does. I, I lived in a farming village and that was uh, trying to chat up as many women in the local communities I could at 18 with my newly found green berry and ego uh, and try and coax them into a relationship and was failing massively at it. But that's what I was attempting to do. <laughs> Mate, I rocked up at Bickley uh and it was rear party so i come straight out of the hecticness of limpston where you you well you never have a minute to say even when you're asleep there's another eight what well, seven guys in the room right mm. it's seven guys five guys can't remember can't remember but so we rocked up at limpston norway rear party and there was nothing there was nobody there was nothing to do. You, you're supposed to turn two in the morning for PT, I don't know, eight o'clock or something. And they go and run you up and down Killer Hill a few times. Mm. But to be honest, I reckon you could have not even bothered turning up for that. And nobody, you had to go and find your own grot. That's, that's room, <laughs> room, room, folks. And um, yeah, it was like a, it was weird. I suppose it was a bit of an anti-climax. Um, I think it probably is. I think when you join any commando unit and it's on rear party, it's a bit like the tumbleweed rolling down the main drag, isn't it? Because it's a skeleton crew that's on there. Um, and, yeah, I, I'd imagine when you've got high expectations. I mean, I've never joined when it was a rear party, so um, I've just, you know, that cycle's been lucky for me. But, yeah, it's probably pretty disheartening, particularly when you come out of commando training and you're ready ready with all the guns going to get stuck into something. And then you're like, yeah, let's go and do a six miler and then clean your weapon. And that's you for the day. Yeah. It's, and, and fucking guard duty, excuse my French, but yeah. <laughs> it's like not, not what you want your first experience of a commando <laughs> unit to be. So yeah. the old K 
cliche then, Molly. Where where were you when you heard about the Falklands, and how did you have to get recalled? Yeah, I did. So um, just mentioned then I'd been out doing my best hobby with cash in the pocket, trying to convince the young females of the local community to uh, um, you know be nice to me, failing at that. Um, and then my dad came in. I was probably asleep in bed. He, he's an early riser, farming community, but uh, he came in and said, uh, the Argentinians have invaded the Falklands and all the commandos and paras have been recalled to the units, to which I sat up in my bed with a hangover. And I was like, what? And my first reaction, because I'd only just joined the Corps, I had no clue where the Falklands were. And I thought, and my dad's Scottish. So I was like, and I thought the reason he was passionate why would the Argentinians want to invade islands off the north of Scotland? Because my first reaction was that's kind of where I thought they were. <laughs> anyway, staggered out of bed, went and spoke to him, looked at the news, and we've been recalled, and, and that's how I got the recall. So I didn't get the police knocking on the door or anything like that. I picked it up from the news and made my way back to Bickley. Um, and uh, I then got there, and it, 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 it wasn't like rear party. It was extraordinarily busy. I've never seen the unit that busy trucks and people all over the place and give them direction, go down here, get new kit, go to the med centre, get jabs, get this. And, it, and it, it seemed a bit chaotic, but I guess somebody was in charge as we were all running around. Um, I remember there was always so Bickley Lane. You remember Bickley Lane, you know, that long, narrow lane. Um, that was just 24-7 was just a line of lorries, military lorries queued up, bringing in ammo. I mean, the amount of ammo, I don't know where they were storing it. I'm sure it probably wasn't in any kind of uh, legal way within the magazines there. Um, but, uh, yeah, that you know, just kit and stores and everything else. In retrospect, I kind of wonder why they were bringing it to Bickley. Because we buggered off a few days later and went to Southampton. They're probably better taking it straight to the ship. But I guess in those days, I didn't really see that. But uh, we were probably sorting out our own logistics you know, uh, and getting ready to support the unit. But yeah, that, that was, um, that was kind of it. And it was, it was very little information. We were just told, this is what's happening. This is where we're going. We didn't know what we were going to do then just get ready to move. And it's kind of bizarre because nowadays, you know, when you're on standby uh, and, and are one to move, everything's prepped and it's ready to go. And there's a plan back in those days that, they didn't seem to be. It was just like you were ready to go all the time. It just gave you information and kit. And it was kind of like, well, you're good to go. You've been trained. We've been training all the time. That's it. We just need to know where we're going now and get on with it. Um, so, uh, and that was the same in 40 Commando, actually, with Ophaven, um in, in Iraq. Um, there wasn't really any R1 there either. It was kind of just like we had 24 hours to get a troop together. Um, and that was it. Crack on with it. So it was, it, it was interesting. I think the only thing that we were recalled there, which was was uh, would have helped my trapping ratings, was uh, you know get ready to go, hurry up, then don't go. So they said, "Oh, we're delayed by another twenty four hours," and they were like, "Okay, that's fine." So what do we do now? We prepped everything and everything together, and they're like, "Right, run ashore. It is then royal." So uh, off we went back down Union Street, remembering forty commando were based there, HQ and Sigs. You know, it was a big, big bootneck contingent then, uh, and and the street was jam packed. But I remember the night just before we went, we were in Boots. Um, do you remember Boots, Chris? Was that there when you were there? Yes, mate. That uh, went yeah, on for yeah. quite a few years. Yeah. So uh, we we're in uh, we we're in Boots uh, doing the old disco dancing, trying to convince the local women to be nice to us as we always do. And then the lights went on and the music went off, and these MPs came in and got on the microphone and said. All members of 4-2 Commando and 40 Commando that are in here. I can't remember if said 40, but they certainly said 4-2. Uh, you need to return to base now. And there's uh, trucks are outside. Get on it and do it now. And we were like, wow. So we all traipsed out. And if there was any one time in your life that you could have trapped, that was it. But we had to leave. Threaders. Um, <laughs> so we got outside and indeed the lorries were there. And we left and that was our last last bit that we saw of Plymouth until we returned a few months later. Were you on Canberra? Yeah, on the Great White Whale. That was How an amazing was experience when we turned up to see that. <laughs> Didn't quite know what to make of that, to be honest. Below 1,600 Royal Marines and 400 paratroopers armed to the teeth signed on the passenger list. 
They rattled on board in heavy boots, but they're under orders to change into soft shoes to protect the floors. Yes, yeah, normally this point in the podcast, I give a shout out for the the staff on the on the cruise liners and and um, um, they were absolutely phenomenal and. Um, they do get forgotten about, Chris, actually. Um, so I was at the Freedom of uh, the City, the Portsmouth Vets, about f- three weeks ago. And uh, I actually went to one of the dinners where all the veterans went and I ended up uh, meeting up with a guy. I can't remember his name because it's on this phone, but I've saved it and I'd have to look it up. But he was one of the crewmen, merchant seamen, that was on, on Canberra and a thoroughly nice guy. And it was really interesting to listen to his stories from his side things that we just didn't consider that they had to deal with. Um, but also um, it was interesting that they don't have any reunions or they don't have any gatherings as such. So he always said that he felt like he had been overlooked a little bit. They are the best sea soldiers in the world, said one officer of his men. On their backs, the kit they'll need to survive in the event of an assault on the islands. So the reason I took his name is when, when we have other reunions, uh, you know, in London and things, is I'll invite him along if he wants to come. I think people would like to chat to him and, and, and would welcome him. You know, it's just we kind of do it, look after, after ourselves, I guess, a little way, don't we, by units and things like that, arrange our own reunions. But, yeah. Yeah, so please, shout out for them. They were great. Yeah, massively. I mean, so brave to go into a war zone with no military training whatsoever and, what a lot of people don't know is when, when the Marines and the Paras went ashore and the guards, et cetera, et cetera, that these civilians took over the GPMGs and stuff. Um, one guy shot, I think it was on the, the Norland that the Paras traveled down, was shot, shot a freaking albatross. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not a good move in, in uh, nautical terms, but uh, yeah. Yes. And were, were you like a lot of people say, were you still thinking there was going to be a, a ceasefire or, or it, there was going to be a negotiations? Yeah, I think so. I think I think we were prepping and, and we were briefing and talking tactics. There's not much more tactics you could do on Canberra until you got on to um, Ascension Island. And even then there wasn't much time to do that there either, really. So there wasn't really that much prep, but there was a lot of talking about revision, I guess, of the theory of things and making sure that the comms were good and all the rest of it, kit was prepped. Um, doing hard fizz was the main thing. I mean, that desk of camera must have just got pounded to bits. Even when you were trying to get your head down, there would be somebody who's almost 24-7 pounding around it. I don't know who the coordinator was, but they're probably in charge of the uh, you know England rugby team now, coordination and admin, to get everybody on there. Um, but I think fundamentally... We were prepared to go and mentally ready to do things. But I think the enormity of what we were being asked to do was so enormous and it hadn't been done really since World War II that we were thinking, is that really going to happen or is this just... I use the word posturing now, but probably back then at 17, I was probably saying, was it just bollocks? (laughs) Political bollocks, excuse my French. But um, it was... I guess that's probably the general feeling. I think most people say that that we expected it to wind down and for the Argentinians to back down. There's no way that they, they would want to, to deal with what was coming their way. Um, but then, of course, that didn't happen. Um, but we were doing, you know, just everything was fine-tuned and prepped and prepped again. Uh, and even though we didn't have really cutting-edge kit in those days at all by any means, you know, it, it was prepped and made sure that it was ready to go. I think the most bizarre thing was we didn't have commando daggers then shouldn't call them daggers i beat myself up before the other big mates all of check commando fighting knives um so um there was talk about making grots so if we had to take sentries and people out but of course they didn't have cheese wire i don't think that's probably high on the qm's list of, of when he was deploying in 48 hours so we had this reel of barbed wire and i remember we have been shown how to make grots out of barbed wire with handles on it that sticks in my mind because one, I was thinking that's not really the principle of how a cheese wire works. The second one is, even though we were quite young lads, how do you use this on somebody? And what we were told was, it won't be quite as quick or as silent, but you just use it and saw it from side to side. So make sure you've got plenty of barbs in the bit in between. 
Now, it sounds silly, but we were trying to make weapons out of everything we could in case we needed them. Uh, and I know it sounds gruesome, and I'd never used it. I'm not sure if anybody did, but we were making these things, and that's the thought process we were we were going through at the time. And I think that kind of brought it home that this had the potential to actually be very brutal if it goes the way that it, it, it did in the end. Gosh, yes. And K Company... Uh... Mount, Mount Harriet, Mount Harriet. Kent. Yeah, so I was in three troop. Um, so K Company. Um, initially, when uh, we went in San Carlos Sound and and we were offloading, uh, we were reserve unit initially, uh, and then that didn't last very long. And then we went to the four, and that's kind of where we stayed. Um, but uh, when 40 Commando uh, were, were getting off the boats and they were in the first wave, um, we were all cammed up and had been shown our assault stations um, to go in. I can't remember if we were in the third or fourth wave, but I think even at that point then, I think in that silence and the brief that we had and we're all cammed out and loaded up and we knew what to do in an emergency, where to go, where to get off and when the fire started, I think we were kind of still is this really going to happen? You know, and we were laying down in these mess decks in our grouping so we could get to our assault station when we were called forward. And it's still kind of an eerie silence. And then I can't remember what time it was. If I'll go back and look at the diaries, you know, it'll tell you exactly to the minute. But then the naval bombardment started. And, and I always remember there was cartoons or some Disney movies or things on the TV in the mess deck. And we're all laid there with all of our weapons bombed up and ready to go. And the naval fire started. And when you hear a naval bombardment, those 4.5 guns going, and uh, they're doing it in unison, it is an awesome noise, even from the inside of a ship. And I think we were just looking at each other, remembering we were, most of us were 18 years old. And I think that's when we were looking at each other and we were like, shit, we're actually doing this. Yeah, I think that was the first realisation because it went st eerie silence as obviously they crept into the sound to suddenly this. And that was the kickoff. And I think that was a, a bit of an eye-opener um, that we were going to... Not an eye-opener. I think that was acknowledgement that we're really going to do this. And I think our minds kind of kicked in then to where there might be, or they'll sort this out, uh, right, well, that's it then. We're in it now. Let's just get on and do whatever we've got to do for however long it takes. Um and then I think the, the next one on top of that was probably, um, although the naval bombardment was going in and that stopped, obviously, the landing craft uh, got closer with 40 in, I'm guessing. Well, I know because I've read some of the books. Um, that's when the air attack started. Um, so I think it was Commander Yarker who was in charge of Canberra as a naval officer. And they used to give the air warning raid, uh, you know, in time. So many aircraft coming, you know, air warning red and distance how many planes. Uh, and that's the first one we had. I mean, you could hear the, the, the machine gun fire and the fire of the missiles and everything going up and, and all the rest of it. Followed by the next one, where we started to say air warning red. Didn't even get the word red out. Uh, and then there was just a massive machine gun fire and everything else. And we all sort of just dove underneath the, the tables and everything. It was a bit of chaos. Um, and uh, yeah, and I guess that's where we, we were kind of in it. And then I was... Number two on the gun was a guy called Mick Smith. And uh, we got told to go and get up to the top deck. So we had pre-positioned firing points, but they didn't want us up there like everybody initially. But when they realised the intensity of that air attack that was coming in, they were like, everybody with a gun, get up there. And as we were making our way along, you, you talked about um, the crews. You know, there's beautiful polished wood floors on the Canberra. And as we... Uh, we're running along with some of the other gun crews to get out into the upper deck. Uh, there's another wave of missiles and machine guns came in and uh, we took cover, but we slid. And it was a bit like the Waltz Ballet as we slid up this polished floor and dragging the GPMG and Link with us um, towards the door as the machine gun fire was coming in. And as I went past in slow motion, I could see a lot of the civilians in the crews. They were all lined up because it was next to the emergency positions with their life jackets on and you know, some of the girls were crying, you know, there was a lot of upset and kind of we had a purpose and a job to do, but I felt sorry for them because I was like, the hell, 
you know, they're probably thinking, what have I got to do now? This wouldn't have been the engineering staff or the crew on the bridge. You know, these, I think, were the support staff. So there was no requirement for whatever they did. So they were just sat there when all this was going on, on around them, um, which I think, I don't think, I'm sure, was extraordinarily frightening for them. For us, I think we were a bit on the unknown and we were doing our professional job. So it wasn't frightening for us. It was kind of exciting and exhilarating because here we were doing all that stuff that we grew up on in black and white movies. You know, that's why a lot of us joined Commando, you know, the the, the little Commando uh, comics and stuff like that. Probably a bit young and a bit naive, frankly. Um, but, you know, that's where we were. And then got out onto the deck and, and started hooked the gun up onto the poles and then started um, firing away and did that for quite a few hours. And, uh, yeah, that was something that will be embedded in my mind for a, a long, long, long time. I mean, the bravery of the Argentinian pilots is one thing, but the bravery of the naval ships that took the bombardment in front of us, just, just amazing. And I had the privilege of talking to some of them, uh, those crews of the ships, um, you know, the Arden, Antelope, um, Coventry, things like that. They just broadsword took some hits as well. Um, but I remember when we were firing and the jets were coming in and they, I mean, they purposely positioned themselves, get quite emotional just talking, they purposely positioned themselves in front of us to take that shit. Amazing, you know, amazing decisions by the commanders and the officers to do that because they've got to put their own boys at risk. But then for the guys on those ships to fight it as well, just very humbling, actually. Because the older I get, the more I, you tell my voice, a bit emotional, the more I realise the courage that that takes, you know, to do that. And it was all about the military output. It wasn't necessarily because they cared for us. Of course we cared for each other. It didn't matter what cat badge you were. We were all humans on the same side. But it was the ultimate goal of knowing that camera goes down and the land forces get taken out before they hit the beach, then all of this so far is for naught. So I think it was that common goal and understanding which was really, um, really humbling, I think, is the way. And I remember particularly one thing, and I can't remember which ship it was, but it was broadside onto us. Um, as a jet, they were coming in and we were tracking and firing. Somebody said to us, aim, I can't remember what it was now, I think it was like 35 lengths in front <laughs> at the speed they moved. Uh, so we were trying best to guesstimate that, probably on the side of a ration pack or however you do it, you know, knuckles on the way going. But when another um, jet came in, I can't remember if it was an end child or not, but he dropped a thousand pound bomb and I caught that out the corner of my eye. And that was to the left of us, half left. And uh, it was really low and I saw this bomb release and come down. And there was one that went over the side of the ship and exploded and rocked the ship back. And then another jet came in and released another bomb. And that one went through the helipad. You know, the helipad on the, the time 22s and, and 42s at the back. There was guys on the back of that firing away uh, with machine guns. And that bomb, almost like, it's like slow motion in my mind. And they say these things are indelible even after 40 years. Came down so low that they ducked because that's all they could do. And the bomb skimmed in between them and over their head literally clipped the ship as it rocked away from the other bomb and landed in and exploded. And I was just like, that. You don't get much closer than that. I don't know if it's a 500-pound or a 1,000-pound bomb, but it was certainly a big bang. And these guys just stood up as the water then exploded and came down and then carried on firing again. Ama you know, uh, amazing courage. That's all I've got to say. Anyway, I've rabbit on a bit there. Get in, Chris. I don't think I've done a Falklands podcast without ending up in bloody tears, mate. It 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 was just it's amazing courage by everybody involved, mm. it, but also for everybody back home. I mean, geez, I mean, I was twelve years old. Yeah, my mates having to watch the news to find out if his dad died that night. He used to put the names of the dead. You you wouldn't have seen this, obviously, but the names of the dead after the battles scrolled up the TV after the news every night. Mm. You know, my mate's 11. He's having to watch the news to see if his, his dad had died. That. I mean, it, 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 it's, ah, uh, uh, yeah. you know, this is our snippet of war. I mean, there's wars all over the planet, aren't there? There's wars ongoing. There's, 
we seem to um, not seem to not get away from it, but mm. it just shows you the effect it has on everybody. Um, I but, think it's, and I think it's not just the effects. I think it's, I think the thing with that war particularly was the intensity of it, how far away it was. And I know we say it was 8,000 miles, but 8,000 miles was a long, long way away with no support. Um, and I think it was the fact that it was a full-on war. Um, you know, nobody nowadays is very used to losing a warship, certainly not cutting edge one. Um, but I know in the village that I grew up called Broughton, and it was a little village with a pub um, called The Crown, and that was my local. And I know my sister who was a barmaid there. Uh, and uh, she said that when Sheffield got hit, you could cut the atmosphere in the pub because everybody, it wasn't just me. Uh, there was Nick and a um, couple of other bootnecks that we all grew up in the same area. So although they didn't hang out in my local all the time, they knew all of us. But she said you could just cut the atmosphere when that came up on the news as a flash of what had happened and it was burning. I think when they saw that it was a cutting edge warship, which it was at the time, and it had been hit and it was burning and it was probably going down, um, I think that really brought it home to people that this just wasn't a Northern Ireland or a bit of a, you know, something that was going on around a canal somewhere or, you know, that it was, this, this was serious when you're losing equipment like that, that, you know, this is going to be a big challenge. And I think that's probably the gravity that everybody felt both at home and, and, and down there and being outnumbered as well, because that was made as a, you know, big number as well. You know, we were outnumbered three to one you know, almost in every aspect. And how heavy was your Bergen? Um, well, of course, I'll tell all the chicks it was 120 pounds. Um, to be honest, I don't really know, but I know it was heavy enough um, that when you wanted to put it on, you had to lay down and put one shoulder on it and then roll over and stand up. That's probably the best way of describing it. Um, but you didn't have you didn't have any very many niceties in there. There just was no room. It was basically section kit, then it was med kit, then it was ammunition, radio batteries. You know, um, I think we had a set of waterproofs, probably one pair of socks and things like that, but that was about it. And then a bit of scram, but everything else was, uh, was ops kit essentially um and then of course when we had to offload and then when we did get called forward and said right now going you know getting down onto the landing craft that was a bit tricky in itself because if you went down in the water in between with all that kit on you probably weren't going to come out well and and somebody did it wasn't in our company but somebody i think just before us had fallen down and the landing craft crashing against the side of camera in these huge waves of ice cold water but he ditched his Bergen and swam underneath the landing craft because that was the IA we were told to do if he did fall in. So it wasn't that there was any nets or anything to stop it happening, but the brief he got was, don't go in, but if you do, do this. And he did and, um, and, and, and got out. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing after 36 years of carrying Bergens, they probably were about 100 pounds, um, you know, um, and then you had two 81 mil mortar rounds on top of that. So there was no other way of getting that short at the time. So every boot neck was part of the logistics train. And you carried those in your hand as well and then dumped them off on the beach when you arrived there. Um, so, yeah, that, that's uh, uneventful for us. I mean, it wasn't a post landing, but we had just before we boarded, um, that's when um, the messages were coming back about the helicopters that had been shot down the reconnaissance heli helicopters, uh, the one in the sea and the other one, Chris Nunn. Um, and that, uh, particularly the one in the water, uh, uh, Wishbury and Eddie, I think, was the pilot. Um, but they were shooting the crews up in the water. Um, so I think that set a precedence as well when those stories were coming back and we're like, right, okay, um, that's not really playing the game as we'd expect. Um, and, and then, although they had established the beachhead, when we arrived, we thought, well, we're just going to establish the beachhead and join in. But essentially, the people, they hadn't opposed the landing, but there had been about 50, 60 people, I believe, there at San Carlos 
uh, itself, then they'd moved. And they didn't know really where they were. So we were asked to go out, um, I think, with, I think it was probably two power on one of the flanks, but to move out outside the ring around it and then to go and put in um, basically listening posts um, to go and see what was going on. So we moved forward. I don't know how far it was without looking at that, but it was it was quite a few K um, on our own, really, uh, to go and do that. And then that was where we basically put a protected perimeter in for the night. And the weather was absolutely horrendous. And then we had to, air attacks were still going on in the sound. Uh, and then we had to go and put a listening patrol out where they thought that there might have been some Argentinian movements. And that was probably one of the most frightening nights besides, you know, probably more so than Harriet because we went out with Mick Eccles' section and the weather was horrendous and misty. And then we found this barbed wire fence and we had to lay there all night, freezing to death, trying to log what we could hear because you couldn't see anything, couldn't see your hand in front of your face because of the mist and the darkness. Um, night sights weren't working particularly well and weren't brilliant in those days, the old IWS. Um, and then... Uh, and we could hear things, but we couldn't make out what they were. Anyway, when we were supposed to come in by a certain time, uh, Mick Eccles said, well, we're going to leave that a bit later because the weather was so bad and everybody was so twitchy. Um, he didn't want to have a blue on blue. And sadly, uh, about an hour before we went in, one of the para units did have a blue on blue with the patrol that was coming in. Uh, and um, I think they, they killed a couple of guys. Um, and we heard shoot, you know, the shots from that. Um, so that was that was quite frightening. And that's the bit I remember about being frightening because just didn't know what was going on, if I'm honest, just vulnerable and out on your own. Um, unfortunately, as we did come back in um, and, and Mick had coordinated this really well, so we were challenged and it was just before first light was coming up and then we got back in safely. But that was the first experience of being vulnerable and that there was a very good chance that somebody was going to try and kill you and might achieve it. And you talk about the cold a lot, but I mean, you guys had 98%, yeah, 98% cold weather injuries. K company had and that was from, that was from Mount Kent. Yeah. Can you talk yeah. us, talk us through that Molly? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, once we did that patrol, then we were we were pulled back down into um, San Carlos itself again, and they did that with rigid radar. Uh, and uh, uh, about counting your men, still happening in those days. We got picked up by rigid radar in the dark, got back down to San Carlos. Then they decided to do a head count and found that one individual, I think it was Jeff, had been asleep on his Bergen and his oppos hadn't woken him up. <laughs> <laughs> and found himself behind enemy lines now on his own, young boot neck, looking around. Uh, so uh, they had to go back down on patrol and uh, the troop sergeant uh, was less than impressed, Lenny, <laughs> having to go back and get him. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that occurred. And then we got orders that we'd be moving out. And I can't remember what the time span, if I'm honest, between when we got back uh, into the... Um, Basically, there were sheep sheep sheds, so that everything was broken down into where you could keep a sort of a, a small flock of sheep. And there's a lots of them, but we had one per section. So can't remember the time span, but anyway, Mick went away and got orders and came back and said, "Right, guys, uh, these are the orders for the night." And basically, we were told, "Right, two night ourselves and." Um, two of the troops from company, so our troop, I can't remember who the other troop was, um, are basically going to go fly forward 50 kilometres ahead of the rest of the British forces. And we're going to be met by the SES at the base of Mount Kent. Uh, it can't take anything with us bar first line food for 24 hours and as much ammunition as you can carry. And uh, we were like, right, okay. Uh, we now then need to take the SES will lead to the top. We believe there's a company on top of Mount Kent holding it. That's what the intelligence is. We are to take out the company and then we are hold, we're to hold it until the last man. And that's the first time we heard as well was that if you get wounded on the LS or if you get hit on the LS, we need to fight our way off. 
regroup. We then move to Mount Kent and fight our way up. If you get wounded during any of that time, do not stop for your oppo. Do not give them medical first aid. Keep moving because we're outnumbered. And if you are a wounded person, patch yourself up and take care of yourself. Somebody will be along within 48 hours. And then we were told when we get to the, mount, the top of Mount Kent, we need to hold that for 24 to 48 hours in order to get the guns in and then the rest of the, the, the uh, force forward. And the reason that that happened was because Atlantic Conveyor got hit and we lost all the helicopters. So four or five had to yomp around. And now we didn't have all the helicopters to be able to move the guns in one wave. And obviously, well, not obviously, if you didn't know, but the Argentinians had predominantly 155. We had 105. So we were outgunned on fire support. So the only way, and that was the main overlook point, was Mount Kent and the dead ground behind there before you got to Harriet and her two sisters, was to keep that secure so we could move the guns in safely to get within range of their guns and have a fighting chance to, to do it. So that was the, that was the plan. Uh, and then we were told, and if necessary, be prepared to hold Mount Kent until the last man. And they were the orders, <laughs> big. And somebody, I can't remember who it was, but somebody in the sort of gloom of the sheep shed when we were getting these orders made a comment and said, is, is John Wayne, I can't remember if it's John Wayne or Clint Eastwood, is John Wayne coming on this patrol with us? Because it was so bizarre, we kind of thought, this is 1982, are we really doing things like this? But the reality is, and history's shown it, when shove comes to push, yes, things like that still happen. Um, so that's, you know, that's what we did. And then um, we got those orders. It was all very sombre. Uh, we had already written the last letters that you write to your families and the Sergeant Major had those. But what we agreed on this one is a lot of us didn't expect to get through this, quite frankly. So we wrote letters where our first month's pay were to go into a pool of money so that those that didn't come back, that basically everybody that did could have a party to remember us when we got back. And we all wrote these letters and gave them to the Sergeant Major and said, here's these. And he was like, what are these things? So, well, you're seeing, open them if, if we get hit. It sounds a bit bizarre at the age of 18 to be thinking like that, but he thought, there you go. And... I would say that this, so I used to do talks to charity on this, and this is probably one of the defining moments of my life that's probably changed my life and made me look and the way I behave around people and how I lead my life. So it was, you know, very low light. These two sea kings were going and chopping away. The weather was poor. And then we were just loaded up um, with guns and weapons and 66s, grenades, just, just weapons, basically, everything we could carry. And as we walked up the hill, because the landing pad was on this top of the slope, there was just all of these other bootnecks that were just stood there in the sort of dwindling gloom. And they were just silent. And I think they knew what we were off to do. And they were just looking at us. And it was a really weird feeling. And, I, you know, they were just staring at us. It was spooky. Uh, and then we got on the helicopters and we were jam-packed in. I don't know how they got those things off the ground, but they did. And then it was all low level flying uh, and it was low level because obviously we were going 50 K, you know, be behind enemy or behind friendly lines, essentially into enemy lines. So as we were flying along, we were all sat there quite nervous on the helicopter. Uh, we got the two minute sign um, ready to disembark. Um, and for some reason I seem to remember that we made ready, but I think we were made ready with small arms. I don't think necessarily the GPMGs were, um, but I may be wrong there. But I remember that the two-minute signal came up and the crewman opened the door and it was just a snowstorm. And it was a flurry of snow. And we were like, holy crap, in the night. Uh, and then when we got the two minutes and we were going in, and this is probably the defining point of my life, remembering most of us were 18, round about then, we just turned around and looked at each other and we just shook hands. And I mean really shook hands. Do you know what I mean? Like, probably won't see you again, mate. And we just shook each other's hands. And it was really, again, I'm still quite emotional about this because at the time, it was just something we did. But as I've reflected on my life, I realised it was a defining moment. And I think the reason it was, and what I've always sort of explained to people when I do charity talks was, 
the odds against us getting through this alive, if this is opposed, is going to be very small. And nobody in their right mind would probably want to do this. And most of us were probably going to be, or a lot of us are probably going to be the wounded or dead in the next few minutes. But I think there's a time in your life where nobody was whinging and whining about it. It was kind of like, well, this is our time. You know, there's, since 1664, bootnecks have done really extraordinarily brave things and continue to do all the way through. Some people get the opportunity. Some people don't. Some people get up against the odds. But that legacy of the Royal Marines doesn't belong to any one person or any one group. It belongs to all of us. It's a bit like academia. And I think that that was our point at that time to do our bit. And we've been asked to do something pretty horrendous. And we were willing to die for that. And it was just our time. That was it. You know, just get on with it. And anyway, roll on. When we went through that process, as we came in, we could see glows on the through the snow as we were coming into the LS. And we were like, you know, thinking what's couldn't really communicate. We were like, you know, what's that? What's that? Because the helicopter was beginning to bank over. And then there was a load of machine gun fire and shots and traces was coming up to the helicopter. And then we banged away really hard. And it was like, doo, 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 you know, that fear. We've all been on choppers where he's trying to get out of a, a crappy situation. And then the door closed and we didn't know what was happening. And we landed up back at San Carlos and we were like, what's that? And when we got back, this is probably about three o'clock in the morning. The Sergeant Major was there and he was in the sheep shed really quietly whispering game. You guys have no idea how much of a close call you just had tonight. And apparently when Goose Green had happened, a lot of the Argentinians were moving back towards, uh, and that had happened 24 hours, 48 hours before this. They were all moving back to, towards um, Stanley. But obviously because the weather was so bad, they had stopped in that position and then were regrouping. And it was right in our LS. And actually... I don't know what the quote is, but I've heard being told because I've met the SAS team, they were stuck in a cave in the middle of all this. They couldn't get out to warn us that they said there was quite a few thousand right in our LS and it wouldn't have gone well by any means. Um, but uh, they then, you know, so we, we got up the next morning and we're like, right, what happens now? Uh, and in all good British plans, there was no other option. It's a bit like, you know, Point de Hoc, uh, Port Passant, this needs to be done. So we're going to do exactly the same thing at exactly the same time tonight. And we all piled on and went through that again. Uh, and that's what we did. Uh, and we landed. And as we landed, um, the, the weather was still bad and there was a firefight going on. Complete confusion. But actually, there were special forces waiting to ambush us. But the SES had to drop on them and ambush them. So that was great. And then it was a snowstorm again and really horrendous weather. They led us up. Um, if you go to Wikipedia uh, and watch Mount Kent and read that, that was obviously written by somebody that really wasn't there. And you would think the SES took this all on their own. I'll be quite blunt about that. Irritates me when I read it. They didn't take us anywhere near the top. They took us and then just disappeared. And uh, it came back down to us. And we we're like, you know, what's happening? It was like, don't know. This isn't the summit. We haven't come across any bunkers yet. And we we're like, right, let's just keep going uphill. And that's what Peter Babington, the OC, said. So we just kept moving um, forward in the bad weather and just um, and waiting to come across Argentinians and wait to get into a fire. And that, that didn't happen. What happened was we started to find positions, started to find abandoned equipment, and we eventually got to the summit, but they'd gone. And, and that was fortunate for us. And the bad weather was fortunate for us because there's a book. I can't remember what it's called now, but there is a book uh, from the, four, I think it's the 4th Infantry who were also on Harriet. They had taken off the conscripted people who were the troops on there because they knew how key Mount Kent was. And what they then did was they pushed out, uh, I can't remember if it was Marine Paris or, or I think it was Paris, but essentially a, a very professional group of soldiers, a company, were coming to take over. But they didn't do relief in place. You know, they arrived, then you leave. They pulled the rest back with them when they left. But the reason that that company didn't get into position was because of the bad weather. And they were literally just down the bottom of Kent on the other side, taking cover from the weather. And we got to the summit just before them. So by the grace of God and the weather, there goes us. And that has always been one of my things that will move forward as an ML in the Corps was if you can operate in bad weather, you've got the drop on many people uh, and the element of surprise. Uh, and then we were on there for 10 days and it was horrendous. 
um, doing patrolling. We didn't, the kit eventually arrived and it had been dropped in the water when a helicopter had taken evasive action from Bukhara. So everything that did arrive, like sleeping bags, a couple of days later, we just soaking wet through. And the next morning when the mist rose and the snow abated, uh, we were literally huddled up with our weapons at first light, waiting to see if there's a counterattack, and your windproofs were frozen solid. Couldn't feel your hands. And we were thinking, you know, could you actually operate a weapon with these? Um, couldn't feel your feet and literally just covered in a layer of frost. And, um, and, and it didn't get much better from there on, to be honest. Um, water supply was short. We had one little hexy block for an Arctic ration, not a box that you could use. Um, so I remember with the guys I was with, you know, China Wright and um, Larry and Woody uh, and, and uh, Bungie Williams, Bungie Williams, everybody's like that, Bungie Williams, which Bungie Williams, Guy Williams. Um, you know, having to go forward and using a neck scarf, that green neck scarf you had, to scoop water on your belly, break the ice out of dirty puddles and then try and filter out any rubbish that was in there to make water. And then when we were making, trying to make a hot wear with a hexi block, we're shaving wood with your Normark off of your pick elf in order to get shavings of wood to try and get enough heat to be able to make hot water. Again, 1982. And you were thinking, you know, it sounds like something from the First World War. To be fair, pick elves were about the most useless fucking thing you could get down there outside of making a fire or smacking somebody on the head with them. Excuse my French. <laughs> because uh, there wasn't much digging going to be done in any of that ground in the Falklands. Um, but that's where we stayed um, for, for 10 days. And the result of that was that 98% of the company had cold weather injuries and still operated. What's interesting, though, in all of that bad weather and that exposure and going through that experience, not a single person went down with hypothermia, which is amazing. And I think that's because people knew there was no Kazibat chain. There, 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 there wasn't. You had a couple of medics with you. That was it. Get on with it. Um, so, uh, yeah. And then the next time we came off, uh, I came off there was basically when um, we were told to prepare and, and get ready to go and um, do the patrolling in and around Harriet and then get prepared to do the assault on Harriet. Geez, as if you hadn't, as if you hadn't had enough. No, there was still mu there was still much to come. <laughs> so, what in that engagement? What was your interaction with the SAS? Because they're not really in their normal role, are they? Put, putting in a, uh, I suppose it was a, what a troop attack for them, a com com company attack. Yeah, com well, direct action. Um, I think it's the terminology they use, but um, um, very little. I didn't see them at all outside of the firefight, and that's just the flashes. Uh, I mean, um, after we'd taken Mount Kent and we were doing patrolling, um, we had to bury the Argentinians. Um, that was uh, quite hard work in frozen ground, trying to do that and uh, trying to fit them in, trying to the rigor mortis is set in, so having to break the limbs in order to be able to bury them and then mark them, take their, you know, sounds like you weren't being magnanimous in victory, but there's there's nothing magnanimous about seeing another human being um, that's, that's been killed or you've killed. Um, there's no animosity in it. It's just professional soldiering. That's what you have to do. So that wasn't a, uh, a pleasant experience, I think, um, you know, being involved in, in that. Um, but the SES didn't really have much engagement. They just disappeared again after that. Bumped into um, the troop commander, who's a brigadier in Ireland, many years later in 2000, actually, and there was eight of us still in 4-2 commando. With the lunatics who were running this island then we were either officers or, or, or warrant officers. And, uh, you know, we, we managed to have a chat with him then um, in, in, in the mess one night in Besbrook. Um, and it, it was yeah, it was good to, to catch up and have a chat, but they had other agendas and things that they'd been tasked with doing. So um, I'm not sure what happened to them after that that event. They would have gone onto another patrol somewhere else. Yeah, because they've had bad luck up until that point, and they, they was it three two helicopter three helicopter crashes two two yeah, on the they had two two on the Fortuna Glacier. 
had the privilege of taking some people across that in 2016 and, and, and came across that area and, and those wreckages are still there. Um, that was a, um, a challenge. Probably they were advised against that for various things because Fortuna Glacier uh, has an ML and do a lot of work and glaciers and things is particularly subject to catabatic and anabatic winds. If anybody's listening and they want to know what those are, they can go and Google them, but it's self-generated winds that are very strong and created out of nowhere. So you can look at a weather report all you want, but unless you understand glaciers, um, it's difficult to comprehend how violent they can be. And then sadly, they lost the one um, in the transit, I think, wasn't it, or going to Argentina where they lost 20 of guys, which was yeah, an absolute was tragedy. Trying to dock on a ship, wasn't it? And, and yeah. it went yeah. down. I think there was about four survivors, not not necessarily the SAS and some air crew and stuff. I think um, having been in that Sea King, going on to Kent with all the kit and the ammo that we had and what you were weighted down with, the life jacket ain't going to help you and you ain't going to get out of those as many dunker drills as you do. If you're jammed in the back of those, you're going down, I think, on Sadly with them. I think we were all probably acutely aware of that as well. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they did um, have some um, tragedies down there. Um yeah, and then basically went um, from there and then really started the patrolling in and around Mount, well, patrolling first for Mount Harriet. I, I think that was both KL and other elements, and I think Hereford were probably involved in that as well at some point. Um, but essentially, in general principle, it was three-pronged approach, really. Uh, one was wrecking and scoping, Uh the second one was finding a way. I mean, Nick Volks, what a man, what a plan they came up with. If we'd done a full frontal assault on Harriet, I very much doubt whether I'd be sat here now. And I think he realised that. So he wanted to look at other options. And uh, so L Company uh, and some of K Company, Jumper Collins particularly, were doing patrols through the minefields. I mean, again, that is just such bravery there. I can't remember the guy's names now, and I know that's terrible of me after these years, but, you know, losing their foot when they were clearing the minefield, you know, in the middle of the night with a bayonet. There was no halo or anything in those days to do that. It was feeling your way along with the bayonet in frozen ground, finding the mines and moving them or marking them. And, uh, you know, a couple of guys lost their feet in that because it was a recce patrol going beyond enemy lines didn't make a noise, didn't scream, shut themselves up, made casually back them back out again so they wouldn't give away what was going on. Uh, I mean, that's just, you know, that's commitment. That is commitment to the overall plan, however much pain you're in and knowing you can't shout out. Again, it's like something from the movies, but that's what the guys did. Um, and then eventually cleared the way through the minefield. And then when they were going through and trying to find a way around the back of Harriet, or between Harriet and Stanley, um, the um, Jumper Collins, who got the uh, MM for this and other actions, was one of the K Company troop sergeants, saw an Argentinian patrol um, and, uh, and realised that they must know where the routes are, you know, safely through the minefields because they were unmarked. That's what the Argentinians did. They just mined things without marking them necessarily. Um, so he actually took a small group of people and followed those Argentinians in at night all the way back through the minefield, marking it and reconnoitering it, and then finding the safe route to the start line and then up to Harriet. Um, again, extraordinarily bravely courageous thing. There was 350, 400 people on Harriet, and about six of them doing this. Um, they went and did that and then came back. And then once that had been agreed that that's what the plan was going to be to go around the rear, then there was some other patrolling that went on. One, one was doing faint and fighting patrols on the front of Harriet, so it looked like we were probing. Um, so one troop and two troop um, particularly did one where they went right into the enemy lines. Um, one night, we were the reserve troop, and the amount of firepower that came down on those guys was just absolutely eye-watering. I mean, it went on. I can't remember how long, but it went on for several hours. Um, we hadn't been called forward and we we're expecting to and thinking there's no way anybody's going to come out of that alive. And then eventually the fire started to dwindle and they came back. And every single bloke from that patrol 
came back, and the only reason they came back was because they ran out of ammunition. <laughs> and they came back. They'd been in a firefight for several hours, um, killed a lot of Argentinians and wounded them, and they hadn't taken one single casualty themselves, and it was all close quarter fighting. Um, but, you know, it set the tone that we were probing, so that's where the Argentinians were expecting to come from. Uh, and then the other one was then positioning ourselves um, on Mount Challenger and um, for mortars and then also for blowpipe. Do you ever come across one of those, Chris? Not personally. Anti-aircraft missile things that could be used for bunker busting. The most cumbersome, oblong piece of kit with a big tube on the end and useless bit of kit ever designed and sold to the MOD. So um, the idea was to get Milans in so we could use those for bunker busting as well as the 66s. Um, but they had to be close enough from Challenger in range of the bunkers on Harriet. So you were quite close to the enemy and you could hear a pin drop out there. There's nothing on the Falklands if you've not been there. So when it's quiet and a still night, you can literally hear things for miles. And uh, so as well as those patrols going on, we were involved in a patrol to take these blowpipes up and pre-position them on top of Challenger. And one, we had to do this quietly and it's like, the world's worst rock assault course down in the Falklands <laughs> at night with no light and carry these cumbersome bits of kit as well as not engaging the enemy at the same time and working out the art and working out if you put them in the right place. So when they're going to use them, that we're pre-positioning them, that they're in the right, you know, the right place they can be found. And the other thing I always remember that is somebody, it must have been air defence troop, said, Oh, these things are triggered with they've got a magnetic trigger or something inside them. So if you drop them more than two feet or do any kind of uh, movement with them, then it will knock that firing mechanism off and they won't work. And we were like looking at this guy going, really? And you want us to carry these up a mountain into enemy lines at night and not drop them? So we went through that patrol. That was a tense night uh, and, and we dropped them off. I don't think a single one of those things worked, to be fair. Um, but we didn't engage the enemy, we got them into the right position. Uh, I don't know if they were used, but I, I didn't hear any stories that they were, uh, and then came back from that. And then that that was essentially the preparation stuff. And then um, basically 10th of June, um, we got orders. Uh, I've got a photo somewhere of uh, Jeremy Heathcote, our boss, as we sat around giving us orders on a rock. You know, very simple, um, very precise not overly complicated of how we were going to do the assault. And it was our troop, three troops uh, job to breach the summit of Harriet. Once the other two troops had gone up and secured the, the lower ridge to breach the ridge and then to clear the bunkers, basically moving from right to left until we met up with L company. And, uh, and that, that was it. Um, we were outnumbered, you know, when I, give chats on these. I haven't done this for a lot of years, but I used to do them for the charity and, and give talks, dinners and things. But, you know, there's certain principles in warfare, which you know, um, don't fight uphill, don't fight into defensive positions uh, and don't be outnumbered and preferably outnumber your enemy three to one. Well, we we're outnumbered three to four to one. We were fighting uphill and we were fighting into defensive bunker positions with machine guns and everything that had had months to prep. So when you put all that into perspective, you kind of think, yeah, the odds aren't that good on us here, but we have got the element of surprise because we're coming around from the back. So uh, basically, we moved through first, um, through Challenger, dumped our Bergens off, and then uh, was supposed to meet up with one of the guards' recce troops, um, which we did, and then they were going to lead us into the start line. Um, uh, and as we were moving along in that, and we realised we, you know, we're very conscious we were behind enemy lines now. And if anything happened, we were going to be pincered between the firepower on Harrier and the potential firepower and everything that was going to come in from Stanley. So it's kind of like an open bowl, open ground at that point, uh, in between the sound. Um, and as we were moving down there, um, suddenly this uh, big balloon flare from the artillery went up and lit the whole place up. And we all dived into these ditches next to a track and took cover and we were like, shit, you know, have we been pinged here because this is now going to be a fight and which direction are we going to fight in? Um, and then it, it went up. There was no firing or anything or no shouting and it just, and then dwindled out of these things do. 
And it was only one, and that was it. And then the message came back down the line going, these these the ditches we think are mined, so be careful when you're getting back out. And that was the only time in my life where I've laid there and I'm literally trying to move with all my fight and ammunition on and trying to move without touching anything and get myself back up onto the track <laughs> that had been cleared by the guys, you know, without triggering a mine. And then there was a bit of hoo hoing around because the recce troop, um, the guards' recce troop couldn't find the start line uh, and got a bit disorientated. And then I believe, because I think Jan King was in this, that there's some elements of 4 2's recce uh, met up with us and then they took us into the start line. And whether that's completely true or not, I'm taking Jan's word for that. Um, but we eventually got ourselves on the start line. So we're on the start line at the base of Harriet, and then L Company were had been delayed because of the same incident a bit, and now it was past HR. So the plan was that we would go up first about 30 minutes, then L Company would go to the left of us up just slightly behind us, and we basically shared the mountain in two halves, for want of a better word. Um, and kind of laid there in the quiet and thinking, people have often asked me if I was scared, and... I've thought about this long and hard and I don't think I was. I don't think I was scared. I think I was anxious with anticipation to get on with the job and let's just get on with it. But I wasn't scared of what was about to come or what was going to die. I think if anything, I just wanted to make sure I didn't let myself down, that I was courageous enough and that I would do what every other bootneck does and we would just get on with the job. Um, I don't know if that's strictly true, but I've often thought if I was scared, and I can't remember being scared. I think I'd have been embedded on my line, on my, you know, in my mind if I was, or certainly not petrified anyway. Um, and then there was a, um, although it was, it's called a silent noisy attack. I don't think I've ever heard of one of those before or afterwards. Um, but essentially, although we had silently moved around and were in position, the word then was for us to go and our company would catch up. And they weren't too far behind anyway, actually, so outside the plan. Because otherwise, if we got pinged where we were, then we'd be screwed and we'd lost the element of surprise. So uh, the uh, ship started firing us in, uh, and uh, that's the artillery that was being used, uh, and that's when the noise started. And then we were given the word to advance. And that was it. It was stand up and advance. And we walked. I mean, the ground was horrendous, rocks strewn and everything else. And we just moved our way through. But we were already in open position in our head, for want of a better word, on our lines of advance as we were going forward. And uh, then I think we were like, when is this going to happen? Now, I've been back to that mount a few times in daylight. And how the hell we moved over that is amazing. I mean, it really is. But we did. Um and we continue to advance and we're thinking, getting very close here <laughs> and nothing's happened yet, which is great so far. Uh, and then fire started and then machine gun fire just started coming down towards us. And it was just every colour of trace you could think of. Remembering those four rounds in between those tracer rounds, it was just a wall of fire coming down towards us. And, uh, and, and I remember thinking, you know, holy shit. And all I could think of is, why don't we have green and blue tracer? <laughs> you know, we've just got red and things like that. Most bizarre thing to think about. But And then as we moved in, somebody um, somebody shouted out in the dark to our right, you know, do not take cover, keep advancing. That's not effective enemy fire. I don't know who shouted it out, but somebody did because the noise was up. And that was almost instantly followed by starlight on me, on me. And that was sadly uh, when Lofty Watts got shot. Uh, and it was almost seconds afterwards. And then I think that there was a general comment between all of us, that sounds effective enough for me. So then we took cover and then we were right, let's start pepper potting, start firing manoeuvre and there we go. And, uh, and I think, you know, I was laid next to Nick Barnett near the gun and uh, this machine of war gun, a fire, just everything was coming down at us. And uh, he said, pull your feet in. And I was laid on the slope. And I said, I looked at him and I said, what do you mean pull my feet in? And he said, and he just looked behind me, he said, pull your feet in. And literally, the ground was just a mass of churning bullets behind us where all these machine gun bullets were hitting. And it was no more than a foot or so behind where we were laying. But I think we were just underneath 
the deflection of the cusp that could come down. So I think the silent attack had worked so far as in that. And then we started to fire and manoeuvre and pepper pot through. So the other two troops secured just below the ridge. And then our section or our troop moved through. And, uh, and then we were just coming up to where we picked a point where we would, would breach the summit. Uh, and then that's when we were pinned down by a sniper. And he was accurate as well. And uh, so we were in a firefight with him. Uh, and then uh, I think it was a company 2IC, uh, Horse Whiteley, uh, who came up and said, we've got to keep moving and we don't want to lose momentum. And then subsequently got shot in the leg, through both legs by the sniper. And we were kind of, took care of him. But we were like, yeah, we're kind of aware of that. But we need to take care of this problem first. <laughs> um, and... Uh, and we did. And, um, you know, we were laying down fire. And then the plan was with Frank O'Neill, the troop sergeant, and Mick Eccles, who was the point section. I was laid next to Mick, Mick to the left of him, uh, was Jock Hugel, who's a legend of a man, also became an ML, uh, was the 84 gunner. The, we'd take him out with an 84 or certainly put his head down and then we'd assault. And uh, Frank O'Neill was going through the... Uh, Remembering this was in the middle of a firefight and it was an intense firefight. Frank O'Neill went through the puss of the troop sergeant with an 84 round load. Jock Hugel replied something to the words of, I've had a heat round in this since the moment we left San Carlos. Let's skip that bit. <laughs> so, of helicopter and everything else. And then he said, OK, right, ready, ready to fire. So we were like, right, put down a load of um, covering fire for him. And then he can get into a position where he can fire. Uh, so we started putting down a load of fire to suppress the guy uh, while Jock goes, expecting him to lock around a, a, a rock or something. And he's a big guy, Jock. No, he's going to do a John Wayne and stand up fully with both legs spread in the middle of the firefight with the 84 on his shoulder and whomped her and let it go, which we were all like, mate, you're the, the biggest target in this troop, but that's off to you. Very, very brave thing to do. Um, so he did because he wanted to make sure he could get the round in the right place. So he smacked that in uh, and then and then we went through to assault. Uh, and this is the bit where I come back to Mick Eccles took me through training where as I went to move and he came out and went forward of me, I saw some movement up in front of me and I shouted Mick down, uh, let off a few rounds. And then he, he, he bollocked me because uh, I was fired too close to his ears. <laughs> <laughs> he was holding his ear and that bit sticks in my mind for some reason and thinking I bet when he was teaching me in training he didn't think that we would be doing this for real anyway we assaulted the position uh, and then basically then for best part of seven or eight hours it was just intense fighting bunker clearing and going forward uh, running out of ammunition um, things that stick in my mind Grenades, hearing people shout grenado in Spanish, and then you can hear it clunk somewhere near you, but you have no idea where it is, and all you can do is take cover and hope it's not right underneath you. Um, to taking out bunker positions and um, putting down intensive fire, um, moving on to the next one. We got to one point where... Um, we took out what was essentially looked like an RAP, but they were firing on us. And then we just carried on manoeuvring forward and, and, and fire and manoeuvre. All the normal funny stuff in the middle of the firefight. People moving. Would he move in a London accent where he'd fallen down a 10-foot cliff? I will in a minute, you twat. Just give me five minutes to climb back up. I've just fallen down a cliff and carry on. People falling down cliffs and things like that because you literally couldn't see. Remembering during all of this, um, we were also taking fire. So it was a ridge to our left as we came up to El Company. So we were taking fire from above us as well. And there was no way to assault that from our side um, because it was too vertical. So it was only about 15, 20 foot. So all we had to do was just keep putting suppressing fire and wait until El Company uh, got up to that bit and took that from the rear, uh, which they did. And then on top of all of this, from the moment where we got onto the, the top of it, um, that was when they did final defensive fire, which a lot of people aren't aware of. And as you know, Chris, that's when you have lost the position 
And that is when it doesn't matter to hold that position. You drop your own artillery fire and mortar fire on top of it and you kill your own as well as the enemy. So as well as all of that, we were dealing with that as well. You know, to the, to the point where we had some prisoners and we were taking them back down to the channel to send them back on down to Sergeant Major when an artillery round landed in between myself, Woody, Larry and two prisoners. We all got blown over, got blown under a rock I think Woody or Larry thought they'd lost the weapon, but it was actually hanging around the other guy's neck. There was an Argentinian under the rock <laughs> taking cover. We were like out, sending down the hill. But the guys that we were covering as prisoners, the round had landed directly on them. One minute they were there, the next minute gone, vaporised, just disappeared. So then we just cracked back on. Um, during one of those incidents, as we were moving through, part of the artillery and the flares were going up um there was dead bodies laying around but i saw one which was um in our camouflage wasn't one of our troop uh and i was like didn't know who he was so i said to the other two guys hang on a minute it's one of our guys here so we rolled him over and there was uh, i thought he was blood but there was mud on his face had a quick check for any obvious wounds and things couldn't find any but it you know it was miserable weather as well so had a very faint pulse. His airway was clear and said, right. So we dragged him back down to the uh, RAP and uh, gave him to the sergeant major in the team and went back up to the firefight. Uh, and, and that guy's name was um, Steve Jakes. Um, so uh, he was a signaller. I didn't know who Steve, Steve Jakes was at the time. Um, but uh, he died three times on Mount Harriet that night. And uh, Wally Walsh, who's the uh, clerk, company clerk, um, kept him alive you know they talk about the gold now nowadays in Afghanistan and Iraq there was no gold now as then we had 26 wounded two dead the Argentinians had many more than that and uh, we had two medics and those medics were absolutely outstanding company medics I mean they were just keeping people alive some of them didn't get catchy about 48 hours gunshot wings shrapnel wings just didn't happen in those days you couldn't get helicopters and safely but you know they, they were in a gully that that's where they took care of each other um so we continued to do that firefight um that was when during that 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 firefight and that move maneuver and bound along that's when um you know well documented incident where there was a group of people waiting to ambush us towards the end of it and um Steve Newland and Sharky Ward and Mick, the three corporals who all got the MM, were talking to each other and saying, look, they're just in front of you, just be prepared. Steve Newland from one of the other troops had gone up behind to try and see where they were, but found himself in a firefight with them, killed a few of them, then got shot through both legs and basically was, was taking cover behind them. But he was on the radio and he said, look, they're outnumbering you here, you're going to have to take them down. And we were like, we can't hit him with 84s and 66s because you're right behind them. And Steve was like, no, just do it. He said, because he said, I'm behind some rocks and I'll just take whatever comes, but do it. Again, extraordinarily courageous decision. Do you know what I mean? So we piled in with that uh, and then took them down. And then, and then the next thing I think where it wasn't over, but the main firefight was, was when just before sort of first light, we started to take a bit of machine gun fire from L Company. So there was a bit of communication there, like, hey, it's us, stop. <laughs> and they were like, right, okay, that's good. So, you know, that's where that's where we were. And then, you know, it, it all sort of went quiet, eerily quiet. And there was very fine snow coming down. And it was extraordinarily spooky, humbling, um, kind of that realisation that this wasn't over yet, we still had stuff to do, but we were alive and we'd achieved this. There was dead bodies and kit everywhere uh, around, covered in snow in various, you know, positions. I think we killed over 50 uh, Argentinians and, uh, you know, and there were still Argentinians there that were hiding, they were in bunkers. So we had to then go back and clear the bunkers because there was bunkers on the front further down the right of us. Um, so we had to do that. So we went and clearing bunkers. I remember one where it had a, it was a command bunker and it had a long sort of looked like a tunnel in it and it was completely closed in. And uh, I was quite wiry, I guess, in those days. So it, I was tasked with going in like the uh, tunnel rat in Vietnam, but without a pistol and an SLR <laughs> to clear this. 
Uh, and as I went in, there was three Argentinians at the bottom of it, still armed. So I was like, you know, Rebus Las Manas still sticks in my mind. I can't speak Spanish, but after all these years, you know, put your hands up, surrender. Um, so um, they did, you know, weren't too happy about it. And then I sent them out. And I remember when they came out, um, I think it was Jock Hugo and a couple of others were strip searching them and taking the weapons off. And one of them had this samurai sword type thing down the middle of his back, which is really bizarre. And I'm glad he didn't pull that out when I was in the tunnel if I had to fight with that. Um, but uh, yeah, that was it. So we cleared the bunker. The snow was coming down. It was all quite eerie, managing the wounded and everything else. Uh, and then um, we were trying to get hot wets and spraying on. And then we sat there and we told, right, be prepared to go across the Goat Ridge and uh, be prepared to take that out uh, as well, which was across at the front of Harriet from us. And we were like, okay. And uh, the next thing that happened was after a few hours was the message came down and it was a very urgent message that there's a load of helicopters being seen being loaded in Stanley and they thought counterattack was coming on. So they said, be prepared for a counterattack. So we all jumped into the top of the ridge line in, in between the Argentinian dead bodies and things, moved them out of the way, took over their bunkers. We didn't have very much ammunition left at all. Virtually no 66s, all the grenades had been used, very little small arms. So, and there was no ammo resupply. So there was a bit of a joke going around, like, it looks like counterattack might be doing this with bayonets. Um, and, uh, you know, we were laid there for a while, prepared for that whatever was going to come and it, it didn't manifest itself but at the time we didn't know it was going to um, and then probably the final story from that one is went across the Goat Ridge nothing happened over in Goat Ridge some of our company went across as well so I think they'd hopped it we cleared it anyway to make sure it was clear and then J Company came up and took over securing Mount Harriet after we'd taken it uh, but then we got told to come back. And I can't remember if that was because of the counterattack or if that came first, if I'm honest. Time muddies your mind. Can't remember. It might be it was a counterattack after we went to Go Ridge and that's why we came back. But essentially we came back up and then um, we were in a gully um, down one side and we were sat there trying to get a bit of respite now. And there was myself and a guy called Dave Picard sat right next to each other in front. Frank O'Neill, Jock Hugel and that were behind us putting up a bivvy and uh, we were trying to get hot wet on and get some food and it, we were very exhausted and you know, a lot of cold weather injuries and just knackered by then and uh, eventually we, we heard a load of fire to our left and it was J Company and you see this in the L Company books they talk about them firing the 120mm uh, mortars back at the Argies so they fired these rounds off and we were like what's that? And somebody went, oh, it's either J Company or somebody or mortars. They're firing the Argentinian mortars back at them. Well, I might have been 18, but I was probably experienced the war then. And I was like, that is only going to result in one freaking thing. And that's going to be an artillery stomp. <laughs> and sure as hell, all we heard next thing was, as a sighting round came over that went over us and landed somewhere on the far side. And then the next sighting round that came in, all we heard was, and it landed right in the gully, 155 round where we were, and took loads of the troop out. And uh, it literally landed. Um, I was blown over. And I remember shaking my head. My ears were ringing. Touching yourself to think, where have I been hit? Because I must have been hit on that. And I wasn't. And then Dave Picard was basically shaking and was, was down in front of me. The wet was still on the hexi cooker, which always amazes me. Didn't fall over. Troop sergeant was hit and forced into a canal in the rock. Jock Hugel had been hit by shrapnel in the side. Uh, who else got hit? Jeff Power had been hit, split to 84 rounds or an 84 round up the middle. And uh, a guy called Rowdy Yates was hit in the shoulder and the arm just further down from the other troop in the gully. But he was a bit of a mess, to say the least. So we patched all those guys up and everything else. And then... Um, then we had to casualty back them. So as well as the other casualty backs, this was probably the next day, we had to then get them down um, the slope. And they were bringing them into the, the dead ground in between. But it was still, there was still sighted somewhere that could see us on the, that slope of Harriet. So as we were taking down, most of them were walked with aided, but Jock had to be carried. So I was on the stretch of carrying him because he'd been fragged through the side. And uh, the... Uh, 
the Argies mortared us all the way down. So we were carrying these wounded down and they mortared us all the way down. It was a long, long route to get those guys down. Um, so we got them down and eventually gave them over. I can't remember which troop at the bottom, but handed them over uh, so they could be taken care of, casualty back. And then, and then we had to make our way back up. And, uh, you know, the Archie didn't disappoint. They mortared us all the way back up again as well. Brilliant. Cheers, fellas. Thanks very much for that. Um, and, uh, yeah, and that, that, that was that bit. Then the talk really then was being ready for the attack uh, on, on Stanley because at that point that would have been the 13th. So there hadn't been any surrender then. So that was when uh, Longdon and uh, Slapper Hill and that were going to go in that night and then be prepared to support them and then move on the assault on, on going into to Stanley. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a long time. And I've, I've been privileged to go back a few times for various things um, to the Falklands. And most of the time I've ended up doing a battlefield talk because there's either one going on or the last to, you know, talk through things or groups I've taken down there. But I was able, it's quite confusing the first time you go, but there was one time in particular where I was on my own on Harriet, not with anybody else. And it was just before sunset. And that, before it wasn't emotional. I was kind of just talking to people about what happened. And this is that line of, you know, departure, this, that, and the other. And on that one, though, that that was quite an emotional, spiritual moment, I think, because I was there on my own. And I kind of reflected on what could have happened, but what did happen, but what could have happened. Um and the other thing that's very bizarre is, A, how horrendous the ground is and how we fought over that into defensive positions. But the other thing that sticks in my mind, how close everything was. So when we were on, and you can find those rocks, you can find those rocks. When we took that guy out, the sniper with the 84 and the other guys, there's a flat rock that's still there. I can see where I fired from, where Jock is, and the distance between where that flat rock was and where we breached, I always, in my mind, thought, that's 100 metres, probably no more than 20. And that massive firefight went on for ages in that period of time, in that 20 metres, you know, uh, with 762 rounds as well, a lot of them, um, you know. And then the other one as well is where that gully was, where the guys got hit. And this is really spooky. So a lot of the people who do the battlefield tours there, they're aware of that incident, but they don't know where it is. So I found that gully and a lot of the ex boot actually, the battlefield tours, you live down there. And I showed them where he was. But the spookiest thing with that is there is one hole in the grass right next to where I was sat. I was no more than probably 15 feet from that 155 round. How I wasn't killed is beyond me. But I know why it is now. And that is because, one, they had a problem with the detonators. But the second thing is it landed in the only piece of boggy, soggy ground in that whole thing if it had gone two inches to the left or right and struck rock. It wouldn't have buried itself as far in as it did, but it buried itself into the ground. And there's just one hole there. It's the only shell hole in that gully. And more spookily, where the flat rock was that Jock Hugo was stood on top of, putting the bivy up for him and Frank O'Neill, the chewed stripey, to get a bit of shelter from the weather, there is a row of five rocks in a line that's still there 35 years on. It's never been touched. And, I, you know, it still makes me emotional now. When I pointed that out to people, those five rocks there have not been touched for 35 years. That's what he was doing when he was hit. How bizarre. You know? No words, mate. Bloody hell. Yeah. Yeah. Bloody hell. It's, I feel like a spectator, you know. It's one thing to you know, hear this story, but to, like, have lived through that it, it's it, it's the extremes of the human experience uh, yeah it, it, it is and at the time when you're young you you don't really think about it but we talk about it now the reunions i help run the reunions or run the reunions every five years or two and it's always the same conversations it was a unique experience but we were part of British and core history, you know, uh, and at the very forefront of it, you know, I think I read somewhere that 
or it was worked out that actually out of the task force of, I think, was it 5,000, I think, in total when the army arrived or whatever, there was less than 1,000 people pressing home that attacks on the enemy, you know, actually closing with them. No disrespect to anybody else. They're all in danger. They're all doing what they need to do on patrols, but actually planned closing with the enemy. Um, you know, it's the same in every war. There's, there's, there's only a small minority of people that do that. Um, so, um, you know, I, I feel honoured to have served with all of the guys in the task force. I feel um, privileged and honoured to do what I've been trained to do. Um, I think we achieved something absolutely amazing. I think we did it at little cost. And here's to Lofty and Smudge, the two guys who didn't make it back from that group. But fundamentally, you know, all the principles of the war, the warfare, we applied those and they worked and we achieved you know, against great odds. When when I was back on that trip, it was the Core Three Fiftieth, and I was very privileged to head it up. So, when I was showing those those uh, light row of rocks out to people, there was a guy there um, called Jim Morris. I don't know if you've ever come across Jim. So he does yeah, welfare yeah. stuff. Yeah. So Jim's an ML as well, and he was in Forty Commando at the time. And I don't know how true this is, but we were from different parts of the Corps. We were talking through. And, doing our own battlefield tour down there for the Core 350. And uh, he sort of said to the group, because we did two sisters, we had people from 4 or 5, Harriet and Mount Kent, and then um, that's what Jim said. Yeah, we we were just down behind on the sound, having come through Challenger, and we were in reserve um, to come up to you. And I was like, oh, I didn't realise that. And he said, yeah, yeah. And he had been told that K Company were expected to take somewhere between 50 and 70% casualties in the first wave. And the L company were expected to take somewhere around 40% casualties. And then it, we would be coming in as a reserve. And I kind of looked at him and I said, is that true? And he went, yeah, that's what we were told. He said it was horrific figures. And we were like, he said, I'm watching the firepower coming down on you guys and fight. We just thought there's no way that they're getting out of that alive. Um, you know, so it's, you know, I guess they'd never tell us that. <laughs> it would go up. We probably still would have gone up because that was our job. Um, but it's probably a good reason why they don't tell you things like that if, that, if that is true. I don't know if it's true, but I don't I have no reason to, you know, disbelieve Jim when he said that to us, you know, and he's quite pointed about it. But yeah, yeah. So I think the other thing is you get a bit blasé about, you know, War weary, I guess, is the wrong word. And I know this happens to guys in Afghanistan and things as well, where the stress and the pressure is on so much. You know, you just become a bit flippant. Like when we moved from there down Harriet and, and we were advancing um, towards Sapper Hill and then towards Stanley, I was on the right flank again, you know, number two on the gun. And uh, the rest of the section were just stood looking at us and stopped. And they were like, don't move. And we were like, what? And we were in a minefield. So, they did have a sign on this one with the minefield facing out, but not so we could see it. And we were like, really? And Mick Eccles was like, yeah, you're in a minefield, mate. But we're in open ground now. He said, we can't wait here. He said, you know, because we're in open ground, if they open up on us. So we're like, right, that's fine. And it was just me and Mick was in there. So I just had a quick conversation with Mick and I said, right, you stay 10 feet behind me. They're anti-personnel mines. I'm going to pick my way through this and just walk out. You follow exactly in my footsteps. That's what we did. In any other circumstances, you would not have done that. Do you know what I mean? But there wasn't any time to mess around. Just kind of like, I wouldn't say I got flippant, but I would say I was just kind of like, well, I've survived all of this so far, so I'm feeling pretty lucky. You know, cool hand loop type stuff. Not that you are, but so I knew the risk I was taking um, and I knew that I'd, if I stood on something, I'd probably lose a leg. But, you know, let's just try not to and walked through it and then and and Mick followed my footsteps so um and we got out of it but it's uh you know I think that happens to a lot of soldiers in lots of conflicts I think you do then you get tired I think you get weary and you become a little bit accustomed to your own demise and you just sort of accept it that it is what it is uh, and you take greater risks I think that's probably what it is I've certainly seen that in Afghanistan I'm sure you have as well people um, getting into that mode 
Um, so, yeah. yeah well, that was it. My experience was Northern Ireland, and uh, yeah, it's it's kind of funny, really. I I I got close enough to the rounds coming in to, you know. When I say that's enough for me, I don't mean like it was too much. I mean that I think in your career in the core, I think if you think of the amount of people that come through the core, percentage wise, probably the vast majority don't see action um, or, or, or see it quite limited. Or even if you're in combat, uh, don't get into a contact. Yeah. But I've said this, I'm going to bore people, but you know, the, the chap behind me on patrol, our tail end Charlie got shot three times, uh, mm. and, and survived. Um, and, uh, you know, you've only, how close do you want to come to it? <laughs> You know, and I remember on the, the last week of our tour in Belfast, the, the int come in that the IRA had. It, this is what we were told. I'm not suggesting it was true, but but y- you know how the rumor mill goes around. But it was that the IRA had Semtex in it every lamppost. <laughs> <laughs> Folks at home, no, no, they didn't. But this is what, yeah. you know, and I remember on that last patrol, I just walked down a white line down the middle of the road. Mm. You know, I wasn't being blasé. I was still, you know, mm. you know, z- z- zigzagging or trying a hard target. But um, it, it's that last week or whatever, those last few days, you feel fucking glad to still be alive. Um, yeah. You know, we're, we're, yeah. I, I don't know how tours were over the years, but we, you know, we, we lost Gilly in the, quite quickly on that tour. Yeah. Yeah. That brings it home to you that it's, it's real, you know, that, that could have been you. All the families at home, all they saw on the news is a Royal Marine has been killed in Belfast. They, they didn't, none of them knew whether that was their, their son, their brother, their, their husband, their, you know, boyfriend, their dad. Yeah. Um, but uh, in those last few days, yeah, you're just like fucking. Hell, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm still here. But yeah. you get that blood. I wouldn't say unprofessional blase. Just it, what I guess what I'm trying to get get to, Molly, is in that last week, you're trying to do all the patrols you can. <laughs> you know, you you yeah. want to get out that gate. Yeah. More more often, when you think you'd want to like reel it in, no, it's like bang. You wanted to, you wanted to be out there. I yeah, yeah, I enjoyed yeah. it, you know. I enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, I think I think yeah, I think you're I think you're right, and it's um, maybe it's more uh, operational exposure. You become more comfortable with it, um, and and just accept that that's part of your day to day life that nobody else in the civilian street would necessarily accept. But that's that's your day-to-day decisions and, and drumbeat but you know that that point you you said about families not knowing what what uh, as an uh, antidote to this um the so my um uh, uncle i call him my uncle but he was part of the family but not adopted but brought up by my grandmother so he's essentially my mother's brother so his name is dave mcdowell He's now sadly passed, um, but he was in the Royal Marines for a, a long, long time. First Sergeant Major of uh, uh, 539. Uh, really good guy. Uh, but he was the LC uh, liaison officer, for want of a better word, in 3 Commander Brigade HQ. He followed my career closely, and every time my mum knew all the dangerous stuff I was doing or joining the MLs course or how I did on courses, she got the scooby-doo from him. So he was a bit of a spy within, so I had to be careful of him. Uh, but uh, he was obviously down in the Falklands in three commander HQ and promised my mum that he would keep me alive. Now, how he was going to do that from three commander brigade HQ, 
when I was in 14 Commando K Company, I don't know. But I was speaking to him years later, and um, when the attacks on Two Sisters and Harriet went in, he was looking at the casualty list and the killed in action the next morning. And sadly, on Two, two Sisters, uh, Marine Gordon Clark McPherson was killed. Mine, the full name is William Gordon Clark McPherson. So you had two McPhersons with almost identical um, um, identical um, initials fighting on two sisters and Mount Harrod simultaneously on the sim night. Sadly, he got killed. Uh, but you can imagine when they saw the casualty list come out the next day that he saw that and he saw Marine W, uh, sorry, Marine GC McPherson, that that had been me that had been killed. And I was going to tell my mother now, he then realised he wasn't sure about the unit, so then he'd made a radio call and said, you know, is Marine McPherson 4-2 still alive? And was told, yes. Saw him this morning, he was still alive then. Right, roger that, thanks very much. Um, but I saw people years and years later back in the local pubs and I went to school and they'd just stand staring at me with their mouth open and I'd be like, what's wrong with you? And they'd be like, we thought you'd been killed in the Falklands, it was in the newspaper. And I was like, no, it's not me. Um, that was another another Marine McPherson on the same night. So, Molly, yeah. did, you, did, you, did you make it into Port Stanley? Yes, made it into Port Stanley. Um, very bizarre. So we had been given orders and we moved up on the morning of the 14th. Uh, we're out of ammunition, no ammunition resupply. And we were literally talking about how do you clear buildings and do fibula with bayonets? Because that's going to be a challenge. And those discussions were happening at every level. And uh, then the white flag went up. Uh, we were working out how to move in. The paras come running down from the left-hand side. And literally running because they wanted to be the first ones in. We were like that, fill your boots, mate. You know, happy days. Uh, and then we went in and then it was that bizarre relationship between Argentinians and coming across them as we were patrolling secure in our area. Loads of them fully armed, you know, and then you'd just both back off because although the surrender had been given, the mechanics of how that was going to happen hadn't been, you know, sent down to the ground, really. Um, so you both back off, you know, just being cautious. The kids, they, they did open up. And then we ended up staying in that um, hangar, the one with the famous picture with all the bullet holes and the shrapnel holes coming through. Um, and then we had to systematically go through all of us and, and, and clear the town. That was the first thing. And a bit of uh, highly high bizarre moments, those, you know. So there was probably the funniest one was we were... Uh, down in the dockyard because we moved towards the airport and the idea was to shovel the prisoners towards that. That's where we'd process them and get them out. So we were yomping along. And the first one was uh, going into different houses, making sure the locals were all right. And then we went into the shop. It was like a village shop in Stanley. And there was two guys in there uh, in suits and suitcases. And um, one of the locals behind the thing was doing the old eye rolling like that. <laughs> they were just behind us with their covered with machine guns and we were like, what? And uh, we went up to them and we said, can we see your papers and stuff? And it was just like the great escape, you know, when they're on the minibus or on the bus and he says, thanks very much in English and then he outs him. Uh, it was a bit like that and there were two Argentinian officers in civilian dress trying to do the great escape mode. We were like that, right, get yourself, get yourself up to the airport. <laughs> they were like, okay, that's fine. There's no other way off of this island. And then the other one that was funny in retrospect, as we got down um, towards one of the industrial areas, massive big hangar, and we cleared all the outbuildings, and there was this massive grey hangar with those huge, huge big doors, like hydraulic doors that you open. And I think we were either in a half section or six of us in the section, and we weren't very many of us anyway, tired, like, ah, oh, junior mum. And I can't remember who it was, but it was like two of them got into this massive hangar door and started to pull it back. And I don't know if you've ever opened one of those, but when they start to move, they like pick up a weight of their own on the grease rails. So as it starts to open, uh, there's and, and it gets bigger and bigger and picks up steam, the two blokes, there's literally a company of Argentinian paras with their red berries on, not conscripts, fully armed, looking very angry right in front of us or in this hangar. <laughs> 
we're like trying to get the door and push it back again now because he's got his momentum coming back and he can't stop it. <laughs> and then I think we're right. We're just going to have to. We're just going to have to. You know, we're just going to have to cuff this one out. So we were like pointing to Wednesday and like Rebus as Manas as angry as you can as an eighteen year old has been in battle, thinking if they open up on us, they could have probably just jumped all over us. And uh, but they weren't happy disarming themselves. That was for sure. They, they were angry and they didn't look particularly happy, but they complied. We were just like, look, this is all over, mate. Let's just just call it a day. And they were like, but yeah, that that was funny. I mean, that was like something out of a comedy movie. And then you know they moved up, and then we took it in turns. Once we cleared the town of uh, processing the prisoners, um, treated them as best as we could, but we didn't, you know, the weather was bad. We didn't have a lot of food or rations or anything for ourselves, you know, so it was pretty poor for both sides. But we treated them with humility, you know, treated them um, with respect. You know, there was no animosity or anything there, certainly not from what I saw around the bootnecks. Stories from that, I think, that were sad. Um Dog handlers having to come up with their dogs, war dogs, which they probably loved those dogs. We weren't going to get those back and feed them, so we had to shoot them, you know, because they, they were a threat. Um, one guy, when we so what we do is we process them and bring them on, take their names and everything else to a table, then we would strip them down of their weapons and everything else, take their ammunition, and make sure whatever they had on them was the essentials on the Geneva Convention, so something to keep the warm food and everything like that. There was one guy, that turned up with a kit bag and he had the remains of his brother in there who had been killed. That sticks in my mind. That was quite sad. And he got quite emotional because he thought we were going to take the boat and we were like, no, we'll take you and your brother and we'll put this in a body bag. We'll make sure that his remains go back with you and everything like that. So, you know, I, I think there was a lot of humility in and around that. There wasn't anything. So um, Murray Briars. Well, there's a couple of guys that, you know, you think it's all over, but it's not with these things. Um, so we were burning a lot of the rubbish and stuff because everything was just an absolute mess all over the place, you know, uh, just even from a hygiene point of view. And, um, you know, there's a couple of instances. So we had a big pile of weapons. Half of them were rusted. You couldn't clear them and things. And then um, there was a, a bonfire that we were burning anything that they didn't need that was on there, you know, to, to manage that. So in the bonfire, uh, um, explosion went off as a round and we all ducked as we were stood round it dealing with these prisoners. And we all looked at each other and we went, anybody been hit? And the guy called Stace, Alan Stacey, had his hand on his neck and he went, I think I've been hit. And we were like, really? And we took to see blood trickling out of his, down his arm. He took his hand away and he'd been nicked right in the jugular vein with a uh, 762 round. Cleaned it up. And it literally, he had a scar. I mean, we still joke about it. He's still got the scar and said so he's gone now. But he had the scar, the shape of a bullet with a pointy bit on his neck for years from that. Talk about lucky. And then the other guy was uh, Murray Briars, who also became an ML. Uh, they were all really good friends of mine because you make a bond in these circumstances at last for a lifetime. But we just finished our group on moving up. Murray Briars was moving down with his. And, uh Again, a grenade had, had been in the fire that had been cleared out and, and exploded and hit him. And I turned around and legged it back with a couple of other guys and he was laid there and uh, clearly hit, uh, ripped out off his, his kit. And he had the classic sucking chest wound, exactly like the videos used to be. Holes in there, blood coming out, but it was breathing. And we were like, oh, this is just like the video. And I remember thinking, I know what to do here. He's got an FFD. Let's use the wrapper with the plastic side out and then strap it up. So we did all of that. Gave him morphine. Now, we all know, I used to be a patrol medic as well. You don't give morphine for chest injuries and things. Well, I can tell you this, down there, mate, you gave morphine for freaking everything because you didn't know how long it was going to be until you got casually back. <laughs> don't care what the doctors say. So uh, gave him some morphine. And, uh, and uh, I remember we were talking to him and he had, his, you know, he had it under control called him for a casualty back, had hand on the wound. And uh, he sort of opened his eyes and he went, I'm all right. And, uh, and he, I can't remember if it was me or somebody else said, yeah, you're fine, Murray. It's all right. Casualty back's on its way. You've been hit, but you're okay. And he goes, he goes, where have I been hit? And I said, uh, I don't know if it's me or something. I said, oh, you've got a sucking chest wound. 
And he looked at us and he went, oh, that's all right then. And then put his head back down as I'm off to And we thought, what's not all right then? <laughs> and that is literally what he said. It makes me laugh to this day. Oh, that's all right then. Okay, yeah, just sucking chest wing. I'll be fine. <laughs> and, and yeah, that was, that, was, that was kind of it. And then we got shipped out um, back on Canberra. And I think that was... Remember, we were waiting for the landing craft to come in and somebody got on the landing craft and it was one of the five nine guys. And sadly, I don't know his name. And as he got on the landing craft to head out, somebody came down and went, we got any engineers here. We found a bomb or an IED at the back of the school, I think it was. And he went, yeah. He said, I am. And he got killed by that when you were talking about that last patrol. Yeah. That's sad. I can't remember his name. I should do, but I remember the incident and thinking we heard later that he'd been killed trying to disarm it. You know, could have quite easily sat there and just been quiet and said, yeah, I'm not here. But he didn't. And, and the other sad, the other sad thing was a follow on from that. The guy I was talking about who we um, found on, on Mount Harry, who'd been injured and died three times on the mountain that night, Steve Jakes. I don't know if you remember being a 4-2 rating, but the following year after Falkland was in Norway, when two people froze to death, the dock and a Marine, that was Steve Jakes. So he survived that. And then the following year in that horrendous blizzard, he was one of the two guys that sadly froze to death and died in Norway. How unfortunate and sad is that? Mate, there's no words. It, it, a, a lot of chaps die in Norway, though. It's quite quite underrated the danger over there it's an extraordinarily dangerous place particularly if you're not prepared and you haven't got the right kit and the right training yeah mm. yeah the weather can the environment can get very dangerous there very quickly and the old um carbon monoxide poisoning when people sleeping in the bvs that, Sleep, sleeping in the bvs or four or five lost some in a tent snow holes you know wrong fuel not venting properly or using the wrong places yeah yeah there's a lot of a uh, lot of things and vehicle accidents are the other thing in norway that take a lot a lot of people down you know there's been some sad accidents in the call with that where mm, they've tipped over in horrendous mountain conditions but you know either been trapped in them or gone into a frozen river and and drowned you know because they couldn't get them out of the vehicles and things just because of the terrain yeah it's you know Considering, you know, I did 36 years in the Marines and did a lot of operations beside the Falklands and, and lots of training and stuff, particularly as an ML. And considering what we do and how we do it and how dangerous it is, the environment and the things that we're asked to do, it just goes to show, and I'm always proud, the testament and how good the Royal Marines are. Because in any other workplace, we'd probably have injuries hand over foot. Do we get injuries and things? Yes, we do. But considering what we've been asked to do, actually, when you look at it and the risk you're taking, it's actually not saying any of it is acceptable by any means, but, you know, you're going to get injuries when you do what we do. Uh, you're going to sometimes get people killed when we do what we do. But we do absolutely everything we can to stop that from happening. But sadly, sometimes events set off a chain of events where things occur and, and sometimes it's unable to stop it and then tragedies do happen but they are few and far between you look how many people are doing how many dangerous things on a regular basis um you know it's 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 quite um heartwarming is the wrong word it's, it's quite impressive from a professional point of view and uh and i think that's because everybody takes their responsibilities in the marines extraordinarily seriously from the individual themselves to each other as oppos, but then from large corporal up all the way through the ranks, people don't cut corners. They will always do the right thing at the right time to look out, out for everybody. Molly, tell us what, what was it like coming home? Um, well, a bit of a blur on Canberra, if I remember rightly. Two cans of beer, which seemed to have go more than two cans of beer where I could get them from. I think that was important to decompress, to reflect on things, um, to put things into perspective. Had a lot of fun, uh, a lot of bonding, a lot of shows. The band were great. They did a load of shows, you know, considering that they had been doing um, casualty relief and everything like that. That was uh, um, 
you know, impressive. I uh, love the Royal Marines Band. Um, and, yeah, and I, I think we were told that we were coming back in to the sound and that there'd be a few thousand people there to meet us. But I don't think anybody believed that. But when we went up on deck, as we came around the Isle of Wight, uh, it was just thousands, hundreds of thousands of people everywhere, small boats. And um, I just remember being gobsmacked, actually. Um, you know, I didn't think, I thought I'd just been out and done my job. Didn't expect to do that level, but that's just how I treated it. I'm just coming back after doing my job, whether it was Ireland or Norway or wherever. Um, so it, it was quite um, quite emotional when we were coming back. And then, of course, then um, we had to then, you know, jump on coaches, uh, head back down to Plymouth, and every village you went to, I mean, it just took for ages. It was just thousands of people everywhere, people jumping on coaches and giving you a beer and ladies jumping on and taking their tops off and flashing their boobs and giving Marines at the front a kiss. I think I was at the back of the bus, so I wasn't very happy with that. Uh, and then we, we headed back to Bickley, um, just stunned, really. Um, told we'd be there, I think, for a week or something, doing admin and de-kitting, but I think it was all done within hours. And it was like, just go on leave, extended leave. Uh, and then it was... Um, train strike was on so there's a train strike going on now but there was a train strike on when we came back so there was no trains and most of us didn't have cars in those days you know so we relied heavily on trains but there was no trains so i remember thumbing a lift uh and uh a guy picked me up and i can't remember was i in rig i think i must have been no, i was in civvies but for some reason i think he must have known because I think lots of people are doing this. And he pulled over and he said, you know, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm just trying to farm. I'm just trying to get home and leave. And then he was like, have you been in the Falklands? I went, yeah. And he wasn't going anywhere near where I lived in Cambridgeshire. He said, I'll drive you there. And I said, no, no. I said, just drop me off and I'll get another lift. He said, no, I'm driving you back. And I went, okay. I really appreciate it. And then he dropped me off in Huntingdon and, uh, there's a pub there called The Eagle. A friend I used to go to school with, Dad owned it. So I was like, right, I'm going in The Eagle for a pint, see what it's about. And there was about four other Marines um, that came from the same area. We all went to school about the same time. So um, particularly Andy Bish and Paul Hunt. I don't know if you've been watching Paul on Facebook. He just gone up Everest after a lung transplant. Uh, so, and Gaia, didn't really know him that well. Kev guy or anything. Anyway, we used to meet up there on leave, so I thought they might be in as well. They'd all been down the four clues, hoping first made it back or the boot next in the pub. And my dad came in and he was like, we live in a village about six miles away and he was like, you know, uh, uh, and I'd already finished my beer and I said, oh, do you want a beer, dad? And he was like, no, 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 no. He said, we need to go. And I was like, hey, I said, I want to have a beer. He said, oh, there's, there's some beer back at the house. And I was like thinking, well, that's not very, uh, it's not very helpful, you know, after coming back. And I was like, okay, then. Uh, jumped in the car. But, of course, as we drove into the village, we drove up the drive to our house. Uh, there was all the banners and the whole village were there, party, barbecue. And that's why he wanted to get me there because everybody was there for a party. And, uh, and we had, you know, a great party. But I have to say, um, I kind of didn't enjoy that, actually. And um, although everybody was really happy to see me and stuff like that, I took myself off probably about 10 o'clock with a bottle of whiskey and went and sat in my bedroom in the dark and just drank that for a couple of hours. Didn't drink the whole bottle. I wasn't in that mood, like him, but I just wanted to sit whiskey and reflect. And I wasn't in a happy place, I have to say, I don't know why. I wasn't in a bad place either, but I just wanted to be alone. Does that make sense? Sometimes you can get a bit too much frivolity. I hadn't had really time to reflect on it on my own, so I just wanted a bit of time to, um, yeah, just to reflect and be on my own, I think. And uh, sometimes I think that can be important. And um, I've experienced that coming back from other ops as well, where people have planned parties, and I've said, explicitly said, I don't want a party you know, have a few friends around for a meal or something a couple of days later or whatever and drinks, but I'd rather just see the kids, particularly our kids and things, and just 
get back to normality and time to reflect. Um, and I don't know why I felt like that. I didn't expect to, but I did. Uh, so that was a bit, uh, a bit odd. And then, you know, and that was fine. And then after a few hours, went back out and yeah, a lady I spent most of my um, time in as a child, as best man at my wedding, uh, Francis, uh, Fran, uh, who very rarely drinks. Uh, we had to cart her back home in the boot of a car because she was pissed as hell. It was brilliant. <laughs> that was the funniest thing from that. <laughs> she never lived that down for the rest of her life. I think she's in her 80s now. She will be in her 80s, same age as my dad. Yeah. But she had a thoroughly good time. Yeah, those welcome back parties, they must have been a funny... Because the public's massively... They, public's massively naive as to the realities of war aren't they that's um, that's why they keep fucking voting for wars <laughs> it's they don't really they don't get the mass you know the the, the, the mass trauma and I, yeah. I, I i remember watching a documentary on the telly i i think it might have been a matlow maybe naval officer or something they they said they they got back into pompey and he was walking along the, the promenade there. And he was like angry that people would eat in ice creams. Mm. He's like, Al, do you not know what we've been through? Mm. Do you, 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 you sat there all smiling, sitting on the grass, eating ice creams. Do you not know what we've all just been through? Yeah. And, and yeah. I don't think I ever felt like that. I don't think I felt angry uh, or, I mean, it's a bit, you know, I think I, I'm quite good at compartmentalizing things, but I think I've always been of the opinion, that's the job, that's the career I chose, that's what I chose to do with my life. So actually, when people want to enjoy life and freedom of speech and say what they want to see, you know, all this stuff about woke this, woke that, um, I don't really buy into it. I think it's just a generational thing. And I think people changed. It would be a sad thing if we didn't change and what expectations were. You know, that was my choice to fight and put my life on the line to defend the country and defend that way of life. And I know that probably sounds a bit naive, but I truly believe in that. I truly believe in queen and country, um, you know, and I know other people don't. That's fine. That's their choice. I fought to defend that choice. Um, you know, please crack on. I think where the only time I get irritated or annoyed is when, and you've probably experienced this, Chris, I'm sure, sometimes we find ourselves for whatever job or whatever reason we're doing in, certainly in the 90s, in parties and things in London with, I think the best way of describing them is probably overly educated people with an opinion but no actual grasp on reality in life. And, you know, I've, I've been at parties where essentially I've been called a baby killer. You know, everybody down in the Falklands was conscripts. And, well, that's not true. And a conscript can kill you just as easily as someone else. They forget that we were 18 years old. <laughs> you know, some of them haven't even left school at 18. Um, so, um, you know, that, that irritates me to some level because they seem to think because you're a serviceman, that you clearly must be uneducated and you, you have um, no other choice in life but to do that. And I've come across that quite a lot of times and that irritates me. And I'm like, you know, it's a professional choice for a lot of people in the military. Don't get me wrong. In some of the army regiments, things there are people in that position. But certainly in the Marines, it is a career choice that people choose to do with their lives. And there's a lot of very clever people in the Marines. Um, you know, when I did that study, um, I've got it written down, so it's probably something like, I think it was 87% have got five GCSEs required to be an officer or more in the core. That's not somebody who can't get a job somewhere else or go on to further education. And there's a lot of people with degrees and a lot of people with A-levels in the ranks, not necessarily as an officer. Um, you know, and, and, and I think that occurs equally speaking. And during the Afghan years, the amount of times that I used to have conversations with well-educated people and well-meaning people 
who said, we're wasting our time in Helmand, we're wasting our time in Afghanistan, in this, that, and the other. And, you know, it's like every other conflict, Molly. If we just sat down and we just had conversation with them and spoke to them, we could probably come to an understanding. And I used to be like, you have no idea of this, what you're fighting, do you? And I used to say to them, you've got no idea at all about this ideology that we're trying to deal with. And I used to say to them, if, 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 if we gave way to them and the way they wanted to do it, and I'm not saying Muslims, I've got lots of friends who are Muslims, and I understand that religion and I'm happy with that. But the ideological part, the extremists, I said they would line every single woman, man and child in Great Britain up the length of the M6 on your hands and knees and would behead each one of you and they wouldn't even bat an eyelid. And I said, and they'd go, oh, I think you're being exaggerating there. I said, I am not. You have no idea of what it is we're trying to contain and what it is we're trying to fight, you know, because you haven't experienced it. And the reason you haven't experienced it is because people are fighting this in other parts of the world so you don't have to experience it. But you shouldn't criticise it either and you should educate yourself a bit more and do a bit more research and understanding of the issues before you start hassling me at a party, frankly, <laughs> giving me your opinions. Molly, listen, we're, I, I'm acutely aware we've, we've literally touched on about 5% of your career what, yeah. what, what rank did you leave the court at? I uh, left as a major. Wow. Yeah, so I got commissioned in two. So I did 20, 20 years in the ranks, and then I got commissioned in 2000 as a major and left uh, 2016. So, um, yeah, um, wasn't something I sought. Um, wasn't something I chased. It was some work and projects that I did. Um, that other people said, have you considered being an officer? I said, well, not really. Um, also saw, saw some less than desirable decisions being made by officers and thought I'd never make a decision like that. Um, so I said, well, I'll give it a go. It wasn't something I was desperate to pursue. Some people who go through the ranks will just keep going back and going back until it's a bit like, um, you know, independence for Scotland, keep going back until you get the answer you want. Uh, so I said, I'd give it one shot took it seriously, um, prepped myself really well. And, and I thought, if I'll give it one shot, if that's successful, then great. If it's not, then I'm not going to keep pursuing it. Um, so I went and gave it one shot and uh, um, obviously did enough to get through and get selected. It was one of the eight, which was, was you know, was great. Um, so, but yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, I, I thought this was mainly about the Falklands. So it's Falklands 40. That's why I concentrated on that. But yeah, it's, you know, I think you take what you learn through the history of the Corps with you. I think my main reflection on the Falklands and how young I was was when I was troop sergeant. So I was in 40s recce and I'd done my seniors, but that was the days where you waited for a year until you got promoted. Op Haven kicked off uh, in Iraq. And then I got pulled out of recce troop with some of the uh, other corporals who passed the same seniors in the unit, told you, been promoted with immediate effect. You're now leaving recce and going to Bravo Company's troop sergeant. And they didn't have a troop because they only had two troops in the companies those days because shortage. So through the night, this myriad of bootnecks turned up from RMR, from other units, drivers, all sorts, including a troop officer who had just joined the unit. We had 24 hours to put the troop together. So once I got to know the, the uh, Tim Cook, who was the troop officer, um, brand new, good guy, but didn't really have a scoop of what was going on. You could understand, like, we're going in 24 hours. We don't have an all bat. We don't have people. So we spent the night interviewing these people coming up, you know, RMR Scotland. Uh, you know, what did you do in the RMR? Oh, I did dash that. Yeah, the thing was good. So I like, uh, particularly like the GPMG. I'm like, oh, can you operate? Oh, it's my favourite weapon, sir. Right, that's the GPMG going to sort it out then. <laughs> so, but it literally went through that to, you know, people, SBS, RMR, uh, AE, RMR, uh, people coming from Med Troop to join us. It was, it was very surreal. But anyway, we formed this troop, we kicked them out with weapons, we got all the kit drawn, we got everything that needed to be done. 
Next day, we're on a Herc. And as we're flying in to, in, not in, yeah, Interlink, is it, in um, Turkey, uh, we stop off halfway and we get a message, get pulled together by the OC. And it's like, right, uh, we thought we were flying into Turkey, then we drive across uh, into Iraq. Uh, however, four or five have moved over to somewhere else. And now we're going to fly into this other area uh, around Saddam's summer palace. And we're going to do it straight from the moment we land. So as soon as we land, troop officers on me uh, will be in the first two black holes. We're going to go and do a quick recce. Troop sergeants, get you guys, get them bombed up. Ammunition will be on there. The Black and Hawks will be turning. We will radio back and tell you a grid and be prepared to land. We don't expect any opposition, but the Iraqi forces, which are the Saddam Special Guard, are less than a K away. So we're not quite sure how they're going to react. Now, <laughs> all of that is a bit like, right, Roger that. Okay, this is taking a bit of a turn then. I haven't even walked, I didn't know these guys' first names as a troop sergeant, we hadn't walked the ground in an orbit of how to even move. And I was like, Jesus, right, okay, there's no cuff too tough. But anyway, when I went back and briefed the lads and everything else and the troop officer, what was going to happen? And I was thinking in my mind, as you do, all of these things, you need to make this work and to look after the lads and make it a success. Remembering I was a 26-year-old troop sergeant I was only 26 then, and I was sat on the back of the herc as we were getting closer in and being told, well, I've got about half an hour, and I was passing notes to people to say, right, you know, make sure you do this and everything else. And I was sat there. We didn't even have maps of the area. We were going to get given that when we get there. So we couldn't even do a map wrecking. Um, and, uh, and I suddenly was just conscious on the back of this herc. You know, you get that feeling when people are looking at you. And I, I looked up from my notebook and every single bloke, including the troop officer, were just sat staring at me. And it was an eerie feeling. And then I realised I am now Frank O'Neill, Mick Eccles, Sharky Warden, Steve Newland. Do you know what I mean? When I was a 19-year-old, 18-year-old in the Falklands, I am now that guy at the age of 26 where the troop officer... And all the lads are just looking at me and they're relying on me to make the right decisions at the right time to keep them alive. And that was a real sense of responsibility. That's probably the time I've been most frightened when I realised that. And then I thought, I'm going to have to definitely be brave and lead from the front here now if something happens because they're going to expect me to lead these guys. Not saying the troop officer wouldn't, but, you know, he'd just come out of training as well. Um, that's a great deal of responsibility at 26, flying into a country with no maps or anything else. <laughs> anyway, there's another bit on top of that that's even funnier, but we might have to do that for another day. Well, mate, I was going to I was going to say we've, uh, like I said, we we've touched on five percent, but um, let's keep it there because uh, the problem that these days, Molly, is when we were in lockdown, people would watch like a free hour podcast. They didn't, you know no one was doing anything so it was mm. the long they called long form podcast was really popular now of course people are like nipping to work they're doing something in the, yeah, you know, yeah. and they look at their phone and they go oh that's a great pod oh us oh, free out oh i'll watch that late and what happens is that later never comes so so mm. we're better to keep this what to what we've done i think it's a great uh, tribute to um, everybody that served in the Falklands um, and uh, and especially, well, not especially the Royal Marines, but in, in our case, um, you know, uh, it, 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 it's great to hear about the Corps down there. And big credit to you, mate. Big, um, big credit for coming and telling your story. Big credit for surviving and big credit for putting up a scrap um we'll we'll take the rest of your life in in a part two molly if that's okay you might want to split this one up into three parts then you can probably do that okay yeah <laughs> we i i've got no 
you know um i love doing this so uh that that's absolutely not a problem there's no real credit to me um i was just a naive well 19 because i was 18 when i just before we went down so i was 19 um No, you know what? I think I was 18. I was 19 when I came back. Oh, I was 18. There you go. Mm. Youth of today. Anyway, um, the, uh, yeah, the, I don't take credit for that. I don't, I didn't talk about this for years and years and years because nobody was really particularly interested, I don't think. Um, you know, I'd speak to other bootnecks about it, but that was, that was about it. So, uh, but I think having read, uh, Sycamore's book, Tony's book, and a few of the lads have said to me that somebody said to me just before the reunion, you realize that we are further away from the Falklands War that we took part in than we were, than, than the Falklands war, war was from D Day. And when you put that into perspective, you think that's quite, that's quite sobering. <laughs> um, but actually, I think you're right. I think a lot of these, um, although we might have lived these stories, I think they are important to capture. And I've met, been so fortunate to meet so many people from the commandos in Dido, particularly here on the Isle of Wight where I live. There was a lot of them still lived here and based here. Sadly, they've passed on now. Um, but listening to their stories, I could listen to them for hours through all in about Dieppe and, and things like that. And, it, you know, just just phenomenal. Mm. Um, the things that they did but what is interesting is their fears aren't much different to what my fears were and every other boot match it's not about necessarily dying and fighting it's about being a failure and letting the rest of your lads down that's what stands out to me in all of this maybe that's about the training yes it's um, I said this uh, in a podcast can't remember which bootneck I was chat chatting to, but there was a book written and it is the chap was talking about coming back from the Falklands and he's talking about all the camera coming in and all the razzmatazz and the people chucking beer on the buses. And I was proud to go there. I was proud to fight, but most of all, I was proud to be a Royal Marine and, uh, yeah, for I sure. I think we've captured that tonight, Molly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chris. I'll let you split it out into three groups. And, yes. Uh, yeah. Stay on the line so I can thank you properly, but massive thanks again, mate, to everybody at home. I hope you've uh, been as engrossed uh, uh, as I have. Um, if you could like and subscribe, that will really help the channel. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.